Dear President Gevlevich, dear President Gröllich and Vice President Linek, dear members, guests and speakers, I'm delighted to start today's meeting of the European People's Party Group in the Committee of the Regions. And I want to begin by thanking President Gevlevich for giving me the opportunity to moderate today's debates and to pay an active part in today's meeting. I'd also like to begin by extending our, our condolences to our friends and neighbours in the United Kingdom on the passing of Queen Elizabeth II last night. I think it's fair to say that we're all um, in sympathy with them today for the, um, the passing of a, of, a, of a leader who showed great service to her country and to her people. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Emma Blaine and I am a councillor on the Leary Rathdown County Council, which is in Dublin, Ireland. I am a part of the Fine Gael Party and I am a proud member of the European People's Party. Uh, before we enter into today's discussion, I just want to give you some practical information about how the day will run. Um, interpretation today is provided in English, French, German, Polish, Czech and Ukrainian. And as always, we'd encourage you to be active on social media. And if you are doing so, please use the following hashtag, um, hashtag EPP local dialogue and hashtag stand with Ukraine. So without further delay, I would just like to uh, present to you on the stage, President Gevlevich, who's the president of the EPP group in the European Committee of the Regions, Jan Grolich, who's the president of South Moravia, Roman Linek, Vice President of Pardubice County and Head of the Czech National Delegation in the Committee of the Regions. And also before I, I go any further, I would like to apologise in advance for my Irish accent, which may um, have me mispronouncing places and names. So I apologise in advance for any offence that I might cause. Um, I would like to, to begin by inviting President Geblevich to the stage, please. Dear host, President Grolish, dear President Weber, dear Roman, dear colleagues, guests and speakers, dear friends. It is with the greatest pleasure and special gratitude that I open our EPP COR meeting today here in the beautiful city of Brno, the dynamic capital city of South Moravia, a region that invests in innovation, that combines modernity and tradition. I see the region that works, works hard and grows. This event offers us a special opportunity to discuss a local and regional perspective of the most important topics in the EU agenda. How to face together united the issue of energy security and supplies the continued support to ukraine and finally how to boost innovation and invigorate our competitiveness i believe it is extremely significant that our meeting takes place today during the czech presidency and in the same day where the EU national ministers meet to negotiate solutions to energy crisis. I'm also extremely pleased to see Manfred Weber, our newly elected president of the EPP and chair of the EPP group in the European Parliament, is now connected with us from remote. Thank you, Manfred. We appreciate immensely your efforts to be here with us today. Another sign of your genuine friendship with our group and your respect and deference toward all EPP local and regional elected leaders. We are looking forward to listening to your inspiring words in the just few minutes. Dear friends, it is precisely 
by quoting President Weber that I wish to start my opening address to you. We can only survive in confrontation with Putin if Europe is the lighthouse of free democracies in the world. Indeed, I believe this is the moment to pass on to our, to our citizens a strong political message. Energy security and supply, support to Ukraine, rethinking innovation policies are all strictly interconnected and therefore must be handled in an integrated manner. Our people, our families, our entrepreneurs ask for a concrete solutions to pressing problems like rising inflation, exploiting energy prices, incertitude for a future provisions for, of gas and oil. We, as a EPP, fully understand the reasons of citizens who are exasperated by continued emergencies and who are scared of what they will find by opening the next energy bill. But it is also true that today 85% of Europeans demand the EU to reduce its dependency on the Russian gas and oil. I believe that our role as a regional and local leaders starts with giving the example by reducing electricity, gas and oil consumption in our public buildings. I have already implemented it in my region because in the winter, lowering heating temperature by only one degree could lead to substantial savings and thus increase common security. This, I believe, should be the way forward if we want to succeed, especially by enhancing interregional and cross-border cooperation, fruitful discussion between the public sector with the innovation, uh, with the innovation hub and the business sector and finally very important by promoting fiscal incentives so regional and local leaders must be the forerunners of the repower eu plan in the order to anticipate energy crisis and not just passively suffer them when it is already too late Dear friends, Russian fissile foils are used as an economic and political weapon. It is a weapon that feeds our threats. We must rebuild our energy policies to protect our freedom. And what more with the killing, kidnapping and abusively replacing mayors of Ukrainian cities, the Russian war is a deliberate attack also against local democracy. It is therefore in our responsibility to do everything, not to allow fear and panic to conquer our people's minds and souls. Once again, this is the moment to remain united in solidarity. Building on our existing partnership, EPP regional cities have been in the front line by giving a chance to the millions of refugees, most of them women and children that have to flee from invaded country. And as a poll, I'm really deeply impressed that Czechia alone is now hosting no less than 700,000 Ukrainians, meaning the highest number of refugees per capita in the EU. Dear Minister Jurečka, dear Minister Langsadlova, you have contributed to the definition of the priorities of the Czech Presidency. We have appreciated the outspoken Czech Presidency support to Ukraine including strengthening sanctions and visa restrictions. 
And now it is crucial to support a post-war reconstruction. In this sense, via direct contribution with the, our EPP mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, who is also president of Ukrainian Association of Cities, the European Committee of Regions, together with its members and stakeholders, established an alliance of cities and regions for a reconstruction of Ukraine. This alliance works like a platform that promotes a transfer of expertise and rebuilding local communities via town twinning, helping to rebuild schools, hospitals, and other key infrastructure. In that context, I wish to thank the Czech mayors in particular for a great job they are doing. The EPP group in the Committee of Regions is at your side ready to help, in particular in a view of next local elections that take place in a two weeks. You can count on us on an EPP CUR group and I believe that thanks to President Weber on whole EPP for any kind of support you may need. Before giving the floor to President Grolisch, on behalf of the EPPCOR group, I would like to thank him personally for his invitation, for his hospitality and perfect organization. The same words I would like to address to our friend Roman Linek. Roman, thank you for your whole excellent work for our group. And last but not least, and let me thank our extraordinary moderator, Ms. Emma Blaine, who is also uh, a member of our group, who accepted to take all over this challenging task. Thank you, Emma, for all your work to help making this meeting a success. President Grolisch, the floor is yours. Dear President Geblevitz, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you to South Moravia, to its metropolis, Brno. The main theme of today's meeting is how regional economies should face the impacts of the current crisis. The crisis means that the Russian aggression in Ukraine persists. Our obligation is, in the first place, to help people escaping the war. We are helping and we will continue to help as long as is needed. I am proud that the Czech Republic and uh, countries in the east of Europe immediately took a clear stance against the aggression because we have a personal experience. I'm happy that our countries stand on the side of Ukraine, but being on the right side costs something, and now we are feeling it in the prices of energy. This is something that we have to address together as Europe, and we have to do it immediately. The people that are the most impacted by the energy crisis are people from whom we most often hear that we should leave the European Union, that the European Union is obsolete. It is not true. However, we have to prove it. We have to prove that we are able to find a common solution during such difficult times. In the Czech Republic, fortunately, at long last, we have a constructive government, a clearly pro-European government, which takes the European presidency as an honor, not as a bother. If the energy crisis is not addressed, there is only one alternative to our government, and that would be a pro-Russian government. And that's not what we want in my country. I want to live in a pro-European country with pro-European partners and neighbors. Here we are mostly local politicians and regional politicians who cannot really influence the whole situation, but we have connections in the high posts and uh, please let us help as much as we can. 
Thank you very much for the topics of today's discussion. We are undergoing a change and the existing situation will clearly have an impact on the labor market and we have to be prepared to face it. My region has a great advantage in this respect. Thanks to the concentration of universities and schools and technology companies and startups, we are ambitious to become one of the most innovative regions in Europe. Thanks to that, we can handle this difficult period and move on. And this is what brings us together in EPP. Thank you for this meeting and I'm looking forward to its outcomes. Um, now, Mr. Lenek, the floor is yours. Thank you. Dear Olgir, our president, Mr. President Gablevich, dear Pane Hitmane, dear uh, First Vice Mayor Petr Hladík, dear Vice Prime Minister of Czech Republic, dear colleagues and guests. Prior to my speech, I would like to thank to all of our colleagues who made this event possible. I would like to thank personally to our host, President Jan Grolich, for his effort and support that allowed us to bring such a high profile event to the capital of Moravia, which celebrates 1200 years of its existence as a distinctive region. I'm honored as a co-host to welcome Mr. Olger Gabrevich, president of our political fraction in Committee of the Regions and all members of our European EPP family. It's wonderful that we have so many distinguished speakers with uh, us here today, and I appreciate that you dedicated your valuable time to us. I'm glad we meet at the time of the Czech Presidency of the Council of the EU, at the second biggest city of our country and the capital of the South Moravia region. We meet at an external meeting after almost a three years pause to discuss two topics, situation on Ukraine and how regions could boost innovations and how innovations could help to fuel the development of regions. At this point, I would like to take the opportunity to continue with my speech in Czech so that you would hear how beautiful language it is. Now I apologize to all Moravian uh, nationals because uh, I can't speak the Moravian slang, I only speak uh, official Czech. In the first uh, presentation we will hear uh, we will hear about how life is in Ukraine and how people are doing when uh, they have escaped uh, to the Czech Republic and other countries and how the regional governments are helping them. In the second panel, we will focus on the situation in economics, uh, where our companies are still facing the consequences of the global pandemic and also uh, the current crisis in the availability of uh, resources. All this has an impact on the fulfillment of uh, European European strategies, especially in the, the area of the environment. I believe that uh, the topics could be discussed not on one day, but uh, they could be discussed uh, for ages, for years. And all this is important for preserving the quality of life of European citizens. They are the obstacles on our way to develop uh, European uh, values and the European house. There is one topic that I'd like to point out to. If I were to describe the current situation in terms of uh, political stability and security, I would think of the word unpredictability. Since the end of the Second World War, there has never been a moment in this world where we would think more about what uh, we have built and whether it is at jeopardy and what the, t what the tomorrows will bring. We look into the future with concern and it is our task to make sure that these concerns were not fulfilled and that the lives of our citizens could continue. The way to overcome this fear definitely 
leads through innovation. Innovation is something that can help our companies uh, in keeping their competitiveness in global markets, because only healthy economics can develop and move on with the whole society. I'm looking forward to today's discussions. I wish us all a lot of uh, fruitful uh, thoughts and discussions, and I hope you enjoy your visit to South Moravia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice President Linek. Um, and finally, I'd just like to hand the floor to Deputy Mayor of Bruno, Mr. Peter Hadlick. Uh, dear uh, Vice Minister Jurečka, Mr. Geblovic, uh, dear uh, President uh, Grelich, Mr. Linek, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a beautiful morning. I would like to uh, speak here as a co-host uh, in the role of uh, the organizer, a co-organizer of this event. Uh, today we have a meeting in the assembly hall. This is where we have the meetings of the Brno City Assembly on a regular basis. Uh, this is the, the assembly hall which was uh, constructed at a time when uh, Olomouc and Brno was taking turns in ruling the Moravian Assembly in the medieval ages at a time when the Czech Kingdom was divided into groups when Moravia had its own uh, uh, sovereign position. Uh, after the Thirty Year War, when Brno, uh, contrary to Olomouc, managed to uh, defend itself from the Swedish army, it was uh, the city of Brno that uh, became and is still the seat or the capital of Moravia. At that time of the Thirty Year War, there was one historic, incredible event that took place. At that time, the Swedish army, who had about 30,000 soldiers, uh, sieged the city of Brno. And here in the city, there were about 1,500 people defending themselves, uh, 1,500 soldiers defending themselves against this huge uh, majority. For three months, uh, the city managed to defend itself from the brutal assault. So it's quite a miracle that happened here in Brno. At that time, we managed to defend ourselves, and three months later, the Swedish had to retreat the army. So the parallel that uh, we are going through these days can uh, be somehow approximated to the defense of Ukraine, which uh, really uh, faces huge military attack uh, by the Russian Federation. I would very much, I would be very happy if this miracle that we experienced in the 15th century here could be repeated in Ukraine. Today, we are here because uh, thanks to the defense of the city of Brno, the assembly hall could develop. And um, today we are sitting in areas where below us we used to have a Dominican monastery. I used to say that this was the first EPP project of cooperation between the public and private sector. At that time, uh, there was a discussion between the politicians and the members of the church, and they decided to build this uh, building on the foundations of a religious uh, order. Today, you are going to discuss a number of topics. Well, unfortunately, I will have to leave you because in two weeks' time we are going to have a municipal election and our target, because of course the, uh, uh, this party uh, is strong, that's why uh, the president of the region comes from the party, so of course we want to uh, boost our position in the municipal um, election as much as possible. Of course, a lot has been said by the previous speakers, but uh, every day I go to see people, I work on the campaign every day, I meet uh, dozens and hundreds of people, and of course you feel one important thing, you feel concern, you 
feel uh, worries about what's going to happen. You feel concerns uh, uh, of the ordinary people, people in the street, businesses, company owners, those who do business either on a local level or in the European market or in the global market. They don't know what's going to come. They're afraid of the energy prices. They're afraid that uh, people will have to be laid off. They are afraid that uh, there will be uh, problems uh, with the economic uh, uh, business and uh, social matters. It is our task. It is the task of the uh, uh, EPP as the strongest grouping. As uh, uh, President Grelich has said, we need to make sure that we need to keep uh, uh, the security in the European Union so that we can find a swift and fast solution, European solution, as uh, our government is uh, striving to achieve as part of the European presidency. I really hope that uh, you will enjoy uh, the event today. Uh, we will meet in the evening at the Spielberg Castle. This is our castle. We will have an informal uh, event. So uh, I'm looking forward to meeting you tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deputy Mayor. And I'm just going to hand over to President Keblovich, who's going to introduce us to President Eber. Dear friends, uh, uh, as I, dear friends, as I announced before, uh, our newly elected president uh, of EPP, Manfred Weber, is with us today. Uh, I don't have to convince uh, all of you because it has been proved that he is a huge friend of local and regional politicians gathered in the European Committee of Regions. He started his political career at the regional level, and I feel that he is still one of us. So, dear Manfred, uh, it is an honor for us to have you uh, to have you uh, with us today, and it is my personal huge honor to right now pass you the floor. All here oh, and all the friends from the uh, Committee of Regions, uh, thank you so much. Uh, for welcoming me and giving me the chance to contribute to you. And uh, uh, Olga, you said it, what I promised in Rotterdam when we had our big party convention, uh, we will keep this promise. And this is the promise that the EPP is, first of all, a mayor's party. We are the party on the local ground. We are proud about this. And that is what uh, what what is also the DNA of the EPP, because we are rooted. We are close to people. We are people's party. So that is our thinking. And that's why you and uh, and the Committee of Regions is really an extremely important uh, place to be, to consider, to think about the next steps. And I also want to thank our friends uh, from the Czech uh, Republic. Uh, they're doing a great job as a presidency. I had yesterday contact with Prime Minister Fiala uh, on energy issues. So uh, there we are really proud about what the Czech uh, uh, government uh, is now really delivering especially our EPP friends in the government. Um, dear friends, when we will look politically to the situation, we all feel this uh, this question of uncertainty and people are worried. People are really concerned and worried all over Europe. Probably what Emma also at the beginning said, especially yesterday's uh, passing away from uh, Queen uh, Elizabeth II, marks also in a way uh, this uh, new uncertainty. She was an anchor. She was a person of stability. We all uh, knew her since decades. Huh? Uh, we grew up with her. And that's why, again, this is also a symbol of a, even a global moment because it's uh, globally recognized. Uh, another, another, another uh, uh, let me say, event where we see things are fundamentally changing. And um, that's, uh, that's uh, the situation. When I recognize the last three years of this mandate on European level. We had election in 2019 and we had some good ideas for the future of Europe, but then COVID came and now the war. So we are more dealing with crisis management than with real long-term politics. And that is in a way the general, uh, uh, the general uh, situation we are in. What does this mean? This means, first of all, uh, leadership. And I am proud that we as EPP and as European Union managed uh, to give a proper answer in the beginning uh, of this uh, war in Ukraine towards Russia. 
we know that uh, this is a fight not only between two countries it is a fight about fight about our values it's a war about our values between freedom and them autocracies and dictatorship in russia putin must lose the war that's clear and we are so proud and 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 we are so we are so honored to see the 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 strength of the ukraine people uh, that they are now really winning back territory in the east of Ukraine. And uh, uh, whatever it costs, we have to go that Putin loses this war. That is the main message. That's a historic moment we are in. On the other hand, we have to be honest to our citizens. War on European soil, war is always costly for the Ukrainians, even they have to pay with soldiers with life. Uh, we in the European Union today, we have to suffer with um, uh, economic impact. Huh? And that is what is today in the center of the debate. You know that the uh, the energy ministers, Olga, you mentioned this at the beginning, they meet today in uh, uh, Brussels. We had in the last days with Ursula von der Leyen, with our friends there, an intensive discussion uh, about uh, what do we propose. The Commission was presenting this week. Uh, uh, key ideas for how to answering the uh, bill question, the energy uh, uh, development question towards our citizens. And um, um, if I may mention some of these details, first of all, Olga, you said it, uh, saving energy is uh, is key. Um, uh, uh, and we also must invest and must speed up in investing in the renewables. The long term perspective on energy is a great one when wind energy, solar panels and all these things will work, then we are much more independent as Europeans and we have a climate neutral energy uh, uh, production in Europe. So on long term, our uh, ambitions are clear and this will be a good future. But the transitional period is the key question in front of us. So saving energy is key. Uh, we have to care about the social dimension. That's why the taxation is important for especially the poor in our countries. We have to care about the business sector, and I must underline not only about industry, steel and uh, chemical industry, but especially also for our SMEs. Huh? Look to the bakeries on the on the corner of our street. They are suffering a lot with the gas price and energy price, and they have no possibility to compensate. So there we have to care and we have to invest. We need the Russian gas price cap. Uh, I think it is not acceptable that Putin is benefiting from today's development on the gas uh, price. We need uh, a discussion about the ETS. You know that we have on European level a regulation on the table, which is uh, producing costs for emitting a CO2 in today's European Union. Uh, and this is also a price driver in a way. It's also part of the price developments. And that's why EPP is fully supporting all initiatives to fight against climate change. After this summer, I think it's obvious to do so. but. Uh, we have already uh, a, 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 an enormous, enormous price uh, development on the energy side. That's why the state should not add to this market-driven development and other price. That's why we have to uh, lower the ETS costs. And we have the re uh, power EU plan on the table. And Olga, I want to assure you that in our talks, in our legislative talks, we will pick up also ideas which you have now included in the document, uh, which you will discuss today that especially the local authorities must benefit huh? because we cannot repower EU. We cannot go into this new world without the local communities. You speak about uh, funds which are then managed directly by the local authorities. Uh, I think that should be also on the on the agenda of our colleagues in the European Parliament when it is about the legislative uh, uh, work there. And finally, on these subjects, the energy market is important. Uh, currently, we have fragmented energy markets in Europe. The interconnectors are not yet there. We are discussing, for, ex for example, a gas pipeline between Spain and France. Macron is refusing this because he wants to protect his uh, nuclear power plants, his, uh, his uh, energy production system in France. So that is not Europe. That is not the European market. And we have to create a European energy market. I tell you that if we would have such a market, then speculation would not as high as it is today because uh, the markets are speculating 
that in November, December, January, when things are really getting problematic for Europe, then there will be a national competition between the member states of the European Union about the gas. And that is also driving the price, this speculation towards an egoistic approach in Europe and not a solidarity approach of Europe. Let me frame this uh, thinking when we discuss this in the EPP group and in the EPP party presidency this week with our commissioners. Let me frame this with the EPP messaging that we stand for a winter of solidarity. That is what we want to see among member states, solidarity and among citizens uh, in our society to practice solidarity. Dear colleagues, uh, this is the most important and the dominating issue. And again, the Czech presidency, uh, Prime Minister Fiala, all the friends, they are really doing a great job to deliver now uh, in short term. Um, but there is more at stake. Uh, we have a food crisis, a global food crisis, where we have to give an answer. And there, we as EPP, we are fighting for our farmers that they can produce, that they, they have a moratorium for additional regulation. Timmermans, socialists in the European Commission is presenting new regulation for our farmers to uh, create further burden for our farmers. We say as EPP, full stop, no further regulation for the next one, two, three years. What we need now is to in allow our farmers to produce food because on global level, it's so urgently needed. I have to tell you that we are running on European level a little bit out of money because uh, COVID was very costly and now the war is very costly. And that's why we will face a debate about the revision of the MFF about our financial regulation on European level, um, whether we invest the money in a proper way. We also have a debate about the future of our currency on the table. You know, ECB yesterday did a great step on the inflation uh, to answer the inflation development with interest rates. And there will be a debate about uh, the future deficit uh, uh, debate on national level on our table. And also the debate about migration is still there, uh, linked to the big solidarity we show toward the Ukraine people all over Europe. Thanks uh, to everyone. It was possible to welcome them. And uh, it was mentioned Czech Republic is one of our heroes in this. Also Polish friends, Romanian friends did a lot, uh, Slovakia and so on. So that is, that is great. Uh, but we don't have yet an answer generally and fundamentally to the uh, to the uh, migration debate. And I have to tell you, I was last week in Rome together with our Forza Italia colleagues to contribute to the campaign there. And in Italy, migration is a top issue, is still a top issue where we have to give an answer. And again, we need a European solution for this. Uh, uh, and I was also happy to see in your document, Olgiert, that you deal with defense, uh, you know that all countries are now investing in strengthening our defense capacity. That is urgently needed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we need also an European pillar on defense when it is about cyber war. I think it's obvious that uh, nobody cares anymore whether the server is placed in, in uh, Prague or is placed in Munich. Uh, people only care, or the issues who are attacking us only care about the software on this server. So the place, the location is not any more important. It's about the technical uh, conditions uh, to attack us. That's why we have to strengthen ourselves, and that means to work together, to build up a European defense pillar. That is what is ahead of us, and we all feel that this is challenging. And I think it's, uh, it's important in today political uh, conditions, to be honest, to tell people the truth about what is in front of us. Because if we are honest, I think people say, okay, we see the problems, let's solve them together. And serious leadership is again needed, is again required, is again asked for. Uh, crisis times are EPP times, are times for serious center-right politics. Uh, and we have now four elections in front of us in this uh, uh, autumn, uh, on Sunday, Sweden, where Ulf Christensen is in a good position. We have a chance to win there. We have then elections in Italy, a big country of the European Union, where the center-right coalition is in the lead uh, with our friends from Forza Italia. And then we have elections in Latvia, where our friend Christianis Karins is uh, leading the polls as acting prime minister of Latvia. Good luck to our friends there. And on the 2nd of October, we will have elections in Bulgaria, where our member party, GERB, uh, with, prime, uh, with uh, party leader Boyko Borisov, is currently leading the polls. It's the biggest party in Bulgaria. 
And I hope that there all pro-European forces can really work together. So we have now four elections in front of us where we can win. It's not automatically guaranteed, never. People have the say in a democracy, but we are in a good shape. And that should be also a starting point for our motivation to answer the challenges of today. Contribute with your ideas, uh, again, with the main message, crisis times or EPP times. You as mayors, as regional politicians, you know this, that people look to us, people want to have answers from us. That is EPP. That's why, Olgierd, I thank you so much uh, for all your efforts, for the efforts of the Committee of Region Group of the EPP. I am as party leader proud about this uh, pillar of our work. Again, EPP is mayor's party. And that's why I wish you all the best for the debates today. And I'm looking forward for the outcome. Thank you so much and have a great and successful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, uh, for your very inspiring uh, words. On a, you touched a very different topics are very, very important and in all, maybe not in all, maybe defense is not in our, uh, in our responsibility, but, but I think that we have a lot to do in common uh, and uh, you can count on our support from local and regional level. I hope to uh, see you soon uh, and face to face discuss how we can be more supportive for the EPP family in those challenging times. Thank you once again, Manfred, for being with us today and once again uh, for inspiring words. And I would say that uh, for the words uh, which give us some kind of hope in these difficult times, because uh, times are very difficult, but it is great when we see that our leader have the idea how to tackle this uh, this problem. So thank you, uh, I, and uh, let's be in touch. And I hope to uh, see you soon, Manfred. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, just checking. This is on. I can hear from Mr. Nick or Mr. Hadjik. Have anything to add, or are you okay? Yeah, okay, okay. Um, oh. Pardon, is that better? Yeah. Thank you. Apologies. I have been accused of that before, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, and thank you so much, uh, President Weber. I know President Weber has a very busy schedule today, and he may be moving on already. So he may wish to, to stay around for the next part of our schedule, where we have two very important um, guests from from Ukraine and two very important testimonials, which will give them some insight into, um, into what the situation is on the ground in Ukraine. Um, dear friends, our event today takes place in the shadow of this terrible and ruthless war in Ukraine. The European Union's support to Ukraine's people remains strong and unanimous. Values such as freedom, democracy, rule of law, self-determination and the safeguarding of human rights must be protected against fear and aggression. With one voice, the members of the EPP group in the European Committee of the Regions welcome our guest speakers today from Ukraine as part of our European family. European regions and cities are confronted daily with the effects of, the, of this war. First of all, they have to provide first aid and shelter for the millions of Ukrainian refugees, including many women and children who have left their home country in order to survive. Now our European regions and cities are working for more long-term solutions for displaced families. Let's not forget that we're talking about the largest refugee crisis of the 21st century, with the highest refugee flight rate globally. 700,000 Ukrainians have reached Czechia. That, as we heard before, is now hosting the largest number of refugees per capita. Now, we've already discussed how it's important to think about the future of this country beyond the current war and to have a long-term vision, not only a short-term and emotional one. 
We are fully committed to strengthen our links via the alliance of cities and regions for the reconstruction of Ukraine. We will transfer expertise on rebuilding local communities via town twinnings, helping to rebuild schools, hospitals, and other key infrastructures in your country. I'm proud to remind you that this alliance exists thanks to the vision of EPP politicians, both at the European Committee of the Regions and the Ukrainian side, including the EPP Mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Shkitschleshko. It's therefore a privilege for me to welcome two very special guest speakers who will shed a light on the current situation in the country, the conditions of the Ukrainian people and their vision for the future. You are the grassroots leaders across Ukraine. You know best what your citizens need in your towns and regions. You will be the builders and organizers on the ground and the local link to building your new Ukraine. Mr. Vadim Bochenko, the Mayor of Mariupol, is now connected with us, I hope. We're connecting. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours if you're ready to speak. Well, uh, welcome uh, 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 all uh, the guests, uh, all the people here. I'm greatly honored to speak here in front of you with the voice of uh, Mariupol. As you know, this is a city which is still the symbol of uh, Ukraine and, and Russian terror. Uh, before that, our city was uh, the leader in the European values. Mariupol has always been a city of development. Uh, strategy until 2030. We were working uh, on a huge vision of our future together with the uh, European uh, allies. We uh, saw Mariupol as a city uh, close to the sea, close to the ocean. But what happened uh, that on the 24th of February, of course, the uh, Russian army invaded Ukraine. Uh, Mariupol, uh, the, the occupants uh, in Ukraine destroyed the city within two months. Within two months time, the Russian occupants killed more than 2,000 people. So these are the statistical data that is available. We have lots of victims. The entire uh, city has been uh, converted to ashes. Uh, it, they destroyed the crucial infrastructure, municipal infrastructure. Everything that we had built building with great love over the past seven years, it all went down to the ground by what we call the Russian peace. I need to say that Mariupol cannot be destroyed morally. This is not only about the buildings, the gardens. This is not only about the schools and flowers. Mariupol, Mariupol people, this is people who are symbols of resistance. So if uh, you have our people living, if you have Ukraine living, if uh, I remember my uh, Ukrainian Mariupol, we are not to be defeated. Currently, our history continues. We are very grateful for the great support uh, for Mariupol. Mariupol was the 12th largest city in Ukraine. At present, the heart of our city lives on. Our city lives in the hearts of our citizens, of our inhabitants. We believe that there will be 
a time when the occupation is over. We believe what uh, uh, President Vladimir Zelensky uh, says. We are already planning the restoration of Mariupol these days together with our leaders, together with our people. We want to help the center. We want to help Mariupol. We are already working on a vision for the future, how to renovate, how to restore our city. This is the heart of our Donbass. Of course, this is going to be the symbol of the new European world. The restoration of Mariupol, this is another chapter of our new Ukrainian history, our new Europe. Our city is uh, a symbol of these atrocities, of this, uh, of this brutal war. But we also believe that this is going also to be a symbol of the renovation and restoration. I know that the history of our city, this uh, events will go down in the global history. Now we are working on a special strategy, restoration strategy. We have, we use uh, modern ways and methods and tools of um, uh, spatial planning, urban planning. We believe that Mariupol will be a showroom uh, of a global scale. Uh, we hope to serve as an example for a number of other cities and towns, an example of how uh, you can build a city raising from ashes. I believe that we will do this together, together with the international community. And this is going to be a city that is going to be flourishing, a city of free citizens, a symbol of civilized world, a symbol of the victory of the European values over the medieval values of the Russian emperor. We are ready to fight uh, until we die. Where we have the debris, where everything is been, has been bombarded, this is where new modern buildings will be, will be erected. We know that uh, our international partners are already getting ready for this stage. That's why I would like to express my thanks to the European Bank and the World Bank for Sorry. And the municipalities, uh, I want to thank Dansk as well for being the first ones uh, for joining uh, large Ukrainian companies in their effort to reconstruct Mariupol. Last, uh, well, I also have to repeat once again, if we do this together, if we unite our forces uh, for the future of our world, which depends on the will of the individual, then we are ready to show that we will do our best for our uh, come victory and for our values. This is not just uh, uh, something that is faced by the Ukrainians, but this is something that is faced by the entire mankind. Uh, we all believe that Ukraine will win the war. Ukraine has a happy future ahead of, of itself. Uh, Slava Ukraine. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Bojchenko. Um, there were really, really inspiring words there. Um, I think we can all take a lot from it, including, including that image of, of Mariupol being a symbol of the new European world and, and the thought of your citizens flourishing as free citizens in the not too distant future, I think we will all, we will all grasp that and go forward with even more uh, vigour. Um, I'd like to hand you up to President Kendall, do you have some comments to Just shortly, dear Mr. Mayor, I am certainly convinced 
that Ukraine will win this, this war. And I'm fully convinced that Mariupol, the city, uh, the symbol of Russian terror, the city completely devastated. We saw and we still have in our hearts these pictures, destro destroyed buildings, destroyed theater with a lot of innocent victims. So we, as uh, Europeans, believe that this symbol of terror will be the symbol of victory and symbol of reconstruction of Ukraine. So I hope that in the next few years Mariupol will be once again green, growing, flourishing city with a smiling kids because it is our common obligation, not only Ukrainian obligation, it is our common European obligation. So we keep our fingers crossed, we have to ensure you that we do our best to support your fight, to protect your, your country, that we are taking care of all of those who have to flee from your city as well. Even in my region in Poland, I'm sure that I have uh, people who have to flee from my Mariupol. But we hope that in the next years that they can go back to the rebuilt, reconstructed, beautiful city. And it is not only my wish, I think, is that it is our common promise. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, once again for being with us. Uh, I just want to send a big respect to your city and to your country, as well as uh, we are sending our material support and uh, as we are trying to help uh, your people, which are running from your country uh, to our country. But it's nothing in comparison with your fight for us and for the free Europe. So big respect. Stay strong and Slava Ukraine. Do you have anything to add or are you okay? Yeah. Um, thank you so much again, um, Mayor Borchenko. Thank you. It's a privilege to have you join us today and we, we really appreciate you taking time out of, out of a, a challenging time for you and your country and Slava. Thank you so much. Um, we, we were due to be joined by Vitaly Kim, um, the governor of Mikhailov, um, but unfortunately, as you can imagine, there are these. Um, there have been some challenging um, challenges um, technically, and um, I think that I, I believe that their their region has been under a, attack, which has prevented them him from joining us today. So. He may join us later on and we'll be here to connect and ready to speak to him if can, but obviously he has uh, greater priorities at the moment and uh, a lot a lot to deal with there. So um, we, we were very grateful to speak to Mayor Boychenko anyway. I think he's given us a lot to a lot to think about and a lot a lot to go forward with. Um, so I, I that um, concludes our part of, of this morning's session.
Thank you so much for joining us on the stage this morning. <laughs> President and Vice President. Thank you. Uh, the war in Ukraine and its impact on the, lo on the local uh, labour market. So we're just getting set up here with the, with the, with the new name tags and I'll, I'll call everybody onto the, onto the panel in a moment. Um, and like I've said at the outset of this, if I mispronounce anybody's names, apologies in advance. Um, but if everybody's ready, I would firstly like to call Marianne Eureka, who's the Deputy Prime Minister of the Czech Republic and the Minister of Labour and Social Affairs. <laughs> and Yelena Zrezhanin, who's the EPP Corps First Vice President. Yelena, is there? Thank you. Emil Bach, of course, who's right in front of me there. And Michaela Shodorova is a member of the European Parliament and Vice Chair of the Cult Committee. And finally, on this panel, we have Alina Krejci, who's the Director of the Centre for Foreigners. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining me here on the panel this morning and to everybody. Um, it's a, a very important topic that we're about to discuss. Um, so we're going to do a series of questions and, and answers. If that's OK with everybody, I'll take you one by one and, and we'll get right into it, if that's OK. And I'm going to, um, going to start with Marianne Eureka. Um, Eureka sorry. Marianne Eureka. Um, Minister, first of all, thank you very much for, um, for your presence here today. We're extremely glad to welcome you, not only in your capacity as the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Social Affairs, but also as a first class representative of the current Czech Presidency of the Council of the EU. We've listened to the testimonies today from Ukraine. Russian aggression has caused the most massive refugee crisis since World War II, as we've discussed already this morning. Europe's unity in condemning Russia's war and showing its solidarity with Ukraine has been impressive so far. And indeed, this includes welcoming and accommodation of millions of refugees. One of the Czech priorities states that managing the refugee crisis and Ukraine's post-war recovery, and this is a very ambitious a very ambitious goal. So can I ask you, which are the main actions taken up by the Czech government in support of the Ukrainian refugees? And have you envisaged a plan for the future for the integration of these refugees? Should the war continue and the Ukrainian, the return of Ukrainian people to their homes becomes a more medium to long term perspective? Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Czech Republic. I need to say that the topic that uh, we are going to discuss today is a uh, pressing uh, and very current. Um, so talking about the migration wave, which uh, is uh, 
Sorry. something that has affected Europe. We are really talking about the specific situation. We have uh, the refugees coming from Ukraine. We have uh, a different composition of refugee, refugees compared to the previous uh, um, refugee crisis in the past because we have a specific composition. We have a major share of uh, women coming to our country, women and children coming to our country and people who are of uh, an older generation. And in fact, these are not the people in a productive age. And of course, as a result, you have a specific demands on the uh, individual member states who have to deal with the situation and will have to deal with the situation in the future. The situation in the Czech Republic is such that uh, per capita, as you've said, we have the largest number of refugees from Ukraine out of all the EU countries. So, uh, as far as I know, we are over 420,000 incoming refugees and talking about the position that we have as the Czech Republic uh, to support these people. Uh, we were very swift uh, in cooperating with the Ministry of In Inferior in Internal Affairs and the towns and municipalities, and we have set up a system uh, where the people have one contact point and they can register in this one point shop, they can uh, enroll for the health insurance, they can also get registered uh, uh, and enter the labor market. To do so, we have also developed a simplified form of social support so that, so that these people, uh, no matter if it's an adult or an infant, they have uh, direct uh, access to monthly financial support, financial benefits. Uh, this benefit is administered in an electronic way to a large extent. And we were quite surprised to see that we have uh, more uh, than half uh, uh, refugees who can apply for this benefit through uh, electronic or bank identity, which of course, uh, reduces the costs of uh, the benefit administration significantly. As regards the labor market, uh, well, uh, I have to take my hat off uh, because the people who come from Ukraine, we see that they want to be engaged, they want to be active, they just don't want to sit with their hands in the lab waiting how the uh, state is going to take care of themselves. And uh, uh, from day one, uh, over 1,000 people started working immediately here. So it's quite a remarkable number. But we can also see certain barriers uh, for the people to do qualified uh, job that is in line with their education, with their background, with their experience. And the greatest barrier, of course, is the language barrier. And of course, we are trying to work on it, but it's not really simple because we feel that a number of people who came from Ukraine, they, if they ask them, uh, when we make all kinds of surveys, when we ask them about the future uh, of their stay in the Czech Republic, uh, most of them keep saying, we want to come back home and we hope to come back soon. They have been saying it from the beginning. In human terms, I fully understand. I would also like to come back as soon as possible, but it's not our decision. It's not uh, uh, the decision of people in Ukraine, but unfortunately it's the decision of the criminal in Moscow. So of course, as a result, you have a certain space of hesitation to what extent they want to be engaged in the English, uh, sorry, in the Czech uh, courses uh, that would give them a better future in the labor market. But I must say that uh, uh, with uh, the past time we can tackle the situation what I see as a big threat is that not each EU country has the same position as the Czech Republic in terms of the labor market. We have the lowest uh, unemployment rate in, e in all the EU countries currently we are at 3.3 percent unemployment rate and uh, our labor market keeps asking for more and more people we have companies looking for new employees but the situation is different in other EU countries, where, of course, you can have a, a, a topic opened up uh, and topic that will be opened up by the populace saying that the uh, Ukrainians take work from the local people. This is a great hazard and uh, Europe has to remember that because uh, these countries will have to get help with this uh, with these issues. And then there is a second risk and this is also already happening. Uh, in fact, we have a, a difficult situation with energy crisis. So there is a concern how to pay for the energy and then they are afraid that they will lose their job and they will lose the 
job because of refugee coming from Ukraine. So this is a very dangerous mix of how the populace can then uh, abuse the situation. And we should really have serious concerns about the future of uh, our election, uh, both in the country and in the EU Parliament. So. Uh, I am in touch with all the uh, uh, presidents of the uh, popular parties. We should really take seriously what Manfred and Weber spoke about. We need to help with the costs uh, of the incoming refugees because, of course, the costs are quite high. And we also have to take uh, the help uh, for the uh, population. We really have to help the families covering the energy bills. If we don't manage, this might be a bomb that might be a problem in the future, in the next year for Europe, for democracy and for how uh, the uh, free democratic country has been operating so far until now. So this is a big threat. Thank you, thank you so much, Marian. That was excellent. And, and thank you for all that you are doing for the refugees. I can empathize with your situation in employment in, in Ireland. We are almost at full employment too, and we are struggling to, to find people to fill positions. So. I think we are in somewhat of a unique position, you and I, in that respect. Um, but you're so right that in other countries it's not the same and there will, resentment will and probably already has grown in, in, in some countries um, for people taking jobs. Um, but thank you so much for that contribution. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on to Elena. Thank you. Um, and dear Elena, you've always been committed to, to promote values such as democracy, rule of law, equality between women and men, as well as active citizenship. Um, moreover, given your strong advocacy for ed education policies, another interesting remark concerns the expectations for the future in that specific field. So your enrollment of Ukrainian children for the 2022-2023 year will provide additional evidence for us of the numbers of refugees planning to remain for the medium to long term in the EU. So can I ask you, in your opinion, what are the most important aspects for every local government to consider when it comes to the integration of Ukrainian refugees, especially women and children, for their active participation in society and the concrete chances for them to build themselves a future in the hosting country? Uh, thank you. And uh, it's really a challenging times in many ways. And I will speak for, for me as a local politician, but also uh, in Sweden, we have a long-term experience of taking refugees and a large numbers. In the last, I would say, 30 years, we have probably been one of the countries who has taken the most refugees of all countries. So we have also developed uh, structures and systems and learned what is working and still we have challenges. Uh, some things are not working. I would agree with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Juretka that this group of people that have arrived has really a strong will to start working immediately. And I think it was, I'm very grateful that the European Union uh, was fast to decide on the temporary protection uh, directive because that means that people can start working immediately. Uh, and in North Sweden, we really need labor. Uh, it's not so attractive always to move there, but we have Northwald, a battery factory that is looking for people. So I would say the people that have moved to Northern Sweden, I would say 50 to 80% got a job. Uh, what we thought when we prepared uh, was that we thought that more Ukrainians spoke English. Uh, so that level was lower than expected. In Sweden, everybody speaks English more or less. So if you speak English, you can get a job pretty easy. Uh, so I would say anybody who has come from, from Ukraine and speaks English, has really good uh, opportunity to get a job. Uh, well, the difference this time that we have not experienced is that this group with the temporary protection directive don't have access to the adult education system. So all the Swedish learning has to go through uh, volunteer 
associations. Uh, and uh, SALAR, the Swedish Association of Local and Regional Level, has been discussing with the government to open up the access for the adult education program. Uh, in Sweden, we have arrived about 38,000 from Ukraine, and 60% of them are working age, mostly women and children. Uh, what really surprised us that we have never in my lifetime seen the Swedish society uh, open up as uh, they have to help in all kinds of ways. So in my municipalities, the phone rang and people came and said, oh, we can help and we can take uh, in people and so on. And all organizations that we knew and also new organizations that started. And mostly it's a beautiful thought, but sometimes people are also impulsive. So, I mean, uh, I have a, a mayor from another country, uh, um, municipality, she said that one day she came to work and uh, somebody that opened their homes said, here is a family of Ukrainians uh, after five days, it's like you can take care of them. And in Sweden, it's not the municipalities that uh, does the immigration, it's the government. But anyway, we in my municipality, we were very fast because we have the crisis management so we opened out uh, 18 cottages with 80 beds. And since these are cottages uh, near a ski loop, we could also have dogs and cats. So uh, we had to find out a way how to pay the veterinarians and so on. That was a new one. We haven't experienced that. But uh, there was never any question about what's right. And I would say that all uh, 114,000 in my municipality has been, been very uh, thankful that we did this and opened up uh, different homes and, and so on. What I have done as a politician is made sure that all childcare and schools are fast to take these children because then these children will learn the language they will have other things to think about than thinking about worrying about their father or relatives, and they will learn the language, and the mothers, usually mothers came, can start working and integrate. Uh, so that has been uh, very good. We have hired Ukrainian-speaking uh, teachers. So all children uh, that has applied for a preschool and school uh, place, we have been within a month or so able to provide that, even if by law we are not obliged to offer preschool because it's kind of expensive, <laughs> but we have done this as a solidarity. So uh, uh, I think that we have to uh, educate these people no matter what age they are, because if they can return to their home, they're going to be equipped with new skills. Uh, and uh, built a stronger and more resilient Ukraine, and uh, hopefully they have enriched our country. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Lena. I think um, I think there's a lot to be taken from what you've just said. Um, I think language is really at the. The, the heart of all of this for integration of refugees across the European Union. It's just, it's a fundamental, I think, and I think we all need to make sure that that happens in our own, in our own, in our own countries. And I also loved the, um, the story you have of accommodating the pets, because I think it's those images from the war that have really driven home to many of us how it's affecting people like you and I and children having to leave their cats and dogs at home and flee the country sometimes is more um, heart-wrenching than, than seeing a bomb fall in the city. So it's the little things that we can identify with. And it's lovely to see that you're accommodating them and even thinking of the finer details like that. So thank you so much. Um, Emil, I'm going to move on to you. Um, now, as mentioned in the Czech presidency priorities, the EU must take all steps to help best deal with the unprecedented refugee wave from the war affected Ukraine. This will require the mobilization of all available resources and expertise as well as their coordinated use. Now, according to the conclusions on the Conference of the Future of Europe, 
the EU needs to take into account the social and economic um, impact of the war in Ukraine and the link between the EU economic governance with the new geopolitical context and by strengthening its own budget through new own resources. Um, so can I ask you, what concrete measures has your city implemented to help Ukrainian refugees feel welcome um, precisely in the medium and the long term? Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. <clears throat> I was inspired by President uh, Weber uh, speech, so I please allow me to have two comments on, uh, on uh, his speech. First of all, we all are agree that Ukraine must uh, win this war. And uh, I would add, we need a strategic defeat of Russia in order not to be able again to start a new war. We are here in Czech Republic. We have uh, the experience of uh, spring of Prague, 1968. We do understand what the Russian invasion means. And we know if we do not have a strategic defeat of Russia and if we do not win this war, next time could be anyone else. So here it's so important to talk with our people and to explain that definitely it's difficult. Definitely liberty has a price. But without this price, our liberty is in danger forever. When we choose Europe as a former European, a former communist country, we choose liberty and have to stand and to defend for that. At the stake in, uh, in this very moment is not just Ukraine, it's our peace in Europe and the future of democracy on, uh, on our continent. So uh, my message is the same as uh, President Weber said, as long as we have solidarity, as long as we work together, we can defend any enemy and we can win this war together with the Ukrainian uh, people. We need a European solution to our European problem. And I salute the idea of President Weber to have a winter of solidarity and the European energy market, because this is the case. And we have to be very careful not to leave room for populists and extremists. If we do not act now and concrete, we are going to leave them opportunity to, to go uh, for the next elections. Concretely, now because you have given me five minutes now, I already used one minute and a half, what we have done at the local level in Cluj-Napoca, the second largest city in Romania, where we have as a country more than one uh, million uh, refugees. First, we explain to the people that this is a marathon of support, not just a sprint. As, is, as democracy itself is a marathon, this support for Ukraine is a marathon. And we are so happy to see, as everywhere in Europe, so many people willing to, to help and to get involved. So we took this energy and we set up an, uh, an, uh, a group of support of 70 NGOs, organizations called One Single Cluj, in order to help together in different fields. Second, call centers. Was, they are very useful. Call centers 24 hours in Ukrainian language, because we have the university uh, possibility to have Ukrainians uh, speaking uh, native, to give them orientation in the city in terms of accommodations, medical services, assistance, and so on. And it's still operating. Another call center is for um, available accommodation spaces. We centralized all the people who wanted to offer uh, accommodations and also the national and local uh, support and have a call center and provide accommodation for them. The third element was to offer psychological assistance, translation services for Ukrainian and legal advice on employment and jobs in the city because you need psychological assistance, but at the same time legal translation for their documents in order to provide uh, jobs in the city. Fourth, we had six collection uh, donation centers in three major areas of the city. And besides, we used the sister city mechanism. For example, we have uh, the city of Dijon, uh, the city of Cologne, which is a sister city of Cluj. They gave us money to provide support and we sent in Ukraine because they said to us, you are closer to Ukraine. You know better their problems. So besides our local, regional, and national money, we 
We used the mechanism of sister city and we helped on the ground in Moldova and in Ukraine many, many cities. Now, um, in, the, in the train station, because it's, it's a transit uh, area in the same time, we set up a transit center uh, in order to offer a hot meal or a bed uh, for their needs in the train station for provisory temporary measures. On long term, medium and long term, we established an integrated support center for information, counseling, legal advice, medical assistance, occupation of jobs with the support of qualified institutions. One center, one shop, as we have in Brussels, one shop uh, center, one shop center for refugees in the city for all the domains and offer them the entire legal expertise. The second issue is what Elena mentioned here about uh, schools and kindergarten. Ukrainian children can be enrolled in kindergarten or schools in Cluj Napoca. We use the private sector in, field, in the field of education. We have private kindergartens who can offer education in English and uh, some of them choose to have education in English. For the others, we offer places in our kindergarten and for the parents who did not choose to, to send their kids to the kindergarten, we provide them um, um, carry age-appropriate activities in one of more than 10 educational or recreation centers and offer service at no cost. So if you do not want to go to the kindergarten, we offer another recreational activities, educational activities with no cost with the support of uh, uh, our municipality. Regarding jobs, and I'm coming to, to, to the end, and uh, we use the integration for the very first moment. I can tell you that in this very moment we have almost 4,000 Ukrainians integrated on the local market in Cluj-Napoca based on this permanent contract, legal advice and working with business environment and with a uh, local agency to offer uh, support in, in Cluj. And last but not least, we offer a hot meal, uh, uh, we call the friendship uh, meal. Every day, around 200 uh, meals are offered at freely by our NGOs. If you want to have a meal, go there with the Romanians or Ukrainians to have together a chat and uh, working together in the city. In terms of European level, I think we need to strongly support what is written here because we feel definitely we need to, to send money to the local and regional authorities in order to better deal with our issues. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Emil, I just have one uh, follow-on question from your excellent roundup there. Just to clarify, the, the kindergarten, the private kindergartens, you're providing spaces for free for the yes. refugees, yeah, like in Sweden as well. It's, that's yes. amazing, yeah. It's voluntarily offered by the, the private kindergartens, but we ask them, are you willing to take 10, 15 uh, kids in kindergarten to offer education in English when the education uh, language is available for them? I said definitely yes. So we, we involve the private sector in the field and it's it's a success and as you said everyone is willing to help in any means starting from uh, uh, taking gear, taking care about the, the pets uh, dogs and and uh, cats but in the same time education and jobs and we want to keep this uh, enthusiasm mm -hmm. uh, as a marathon not just a sprint of support absolutely thank you so much thank you um, now I'm going to move on to Michaela who's beside me here um, now, dear Ms. Shrodreva, could you want to yeah, I'll, uh, speak in English to begin? Um, the Russian aggression in Ukraine has helped to focus attention on the need for digital sovereignty and increased focus on cyber defense and against disinformation. Now, the conclusions of the conference on the future of Europe have stressed that the EU needs to be more assertive to taking on a, a, a leading global role in promoting its values and standards in a world increasingly in turmoil. This also applies to media and communication channels. And indeed, we've learned that this information has already become a key component of hybrid warfare, especially in the way it can influence the perception of European citizens towards Ukraine and the reasons of this ruthless conflict. Now, six months have passed since the Russian aggression started and there's a risk that European citizens are becoming numb to the conflict and its effects, especially those who live far away from the border. So can I ask you, this war has been characterised by an assault on the work of journalists covering it on the ground and beyond. 
on the ground, Russian authorities have sought to discredit free media reports about crimes and atrocities and abusive crimes of war. Do you think that the EU should focus more on media freedom and the protection of journalists and fight against this disinformation in the context of the war in Ukraine, or is this already in place? Do you think we're doing enough? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Emma, for your questions. But first of all, I would like to thank to the committee, to uh, our EPP group in the Committee of the Region, our president, and all who are coming to Brno. I think it's the first time that we can host this important event. I'm happy to see you, uh, dear friends, Emil and others, congratulations for your huge work and congratulations to all regional, local authorities in this uh, crisis time. Uh, so, I will switch to the Czech language because <laughs> it's my mother tongue, it's, uh, it's better for me. Um, Thank you very much for the questions that Emma has uh, uh, raised. Of course, undoubtedly, the impact on the communication and uh, the, the impact of communication and disinformation campaigns uh, is felt by everyone. The first question was uh, as to the outputs of the conference on the future of Europe. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that the conference uh, uh, was a year-long conference. In fact, it started at a time we called the pre-war period. But even at that time, the citizens very well felt they perceived that the lack of uh, a correct and exact information across the EU is the reason uh, for easy manipulation. One of the uh, conclusions of the conference and recommendations for the citizens or requirement, uh, an urgent requirement, was that the European Commission should establish a platform, electronic platform, where each and every citizen can validate, validate and verify the accuracy of the information. I wonder whether the outcomes that uh, uh, we are going to talk about next week on the 14th of September. Ursula is going to talk about it in the European Parliament. So I wonder if such measure will be taken. I think it would help uh, each and every of us, not only the citizens, but also you at the municipal level, at the regional level, those who have, uh, who have the responsibility. So this is one measure that is requested. And it can be a quick measure to implement. And it would definitely help at the time of the crisis uh, when uh, we all face uh, the concerns of the citizens about their existence, about their well-being and the impacts of the Russian aggression. The second measure that is a long-term measure and the people also ask for as the outcome of the conference is education a joint uh, framework for civil education and for EU education so that the citizens from the infants starting uh, from uh, all those that are uh, 17, 18, all the way to the senior citizens, all feel that that the EU should provide a basic framework assistance for schools and teachers so that uh, it, it's not a compulsory but it should be a voluntary model of educating and providing information about the EU. We have uniform institution, we have a, a single EU legislative framework, unfortunately the citizens don't know it and it's not only their fault. So these are uh, specific measures that uh, are arising and as regards the um, freedom of journalists, media, uh, the conference uh, on Europe even asked for a law that would make sure that media in the EU are free. Well, we uh, would like to have like a legislative framework instead, and this framework would ensure the freedom for media in the EU. And next week, the committee should submit a Media Freedom Act. So 
this is an act on uh, which is going to ensure uh, freedom of media across the EU. This is something that will be discussed, discussed but I have no doubts that uh, independent media are the force pillar of democracy. We need them. We need to protect uh, the safety of journalists, the quality of journalists, and the true nature of information that is spread. I just want to draw attention to the fact that the, at the European level we have these positive solutions. Uh, what we use to encourage the freedom of media, but we also need funds to do so. So in this case, I would like to highlight that this is mainly the national states that are in charge of uh, supporting the national media. I need to underscore media of public services, that's how, how we call it, media of public services, that need uh, funds. They really need funds to be supported from public funds. and. Uh, we can rely on such media to provide true information even in this economic crisis, uh, the crisis that, of course, is the responsibility of Putin. We need to call the spade the spade. We need to get the right terms for the crisis. We would not be in this harsh situation if it wasn't for Putin, if Putin did not attack Ukraine. So it's something that needs to be said. It needs to be repeated to the citizens. And uh, we need to spread correct information. So just a side note, when I uh, drive with the taxi driver in Prague and uh, uh, he tells me that 10 million refugees left Ukraine, I'm telling him, no, it was 4 million Ukrainians who were given the status of temporary protection. Four million Ukrainians have fled the country. Four million have the statute of uh, uh, temporary protection. And we know that a great part of them is already coming back to Ukraine. So we talk about hundreds of thousands of people coming back. So we don't talk about 10 million people. And this is something you have to keep repeating in the media. But it's, uh, it's not a duty uh, for the private media to say so they can but we need to have the public media do, that have to keep stressing this and this is also at the EU level so if you are interested in more detailed information we have an institute Uh, like a supervisory board, it's called ERGA at the European level, and ERGA monitors the independence and uh, independence and freedom of media in the EU. ERGA and to fight uh, against the restrictions, meaning that at the same time we need to get the protection against the disinformation websites. So we have Stratcom, uh, this is an organization which is a, a, like a European agency, and as, uh, just to show you the budget of the agency, uh, I want to say how insufficient it is. When this institute was established in 2015, it had about 1 million uh, euros as a budget. Now in 2021, uh, no, it was 11 million euros when it was established. And we are facing a huge campaign. The European Parliament keeps requiring that uh, this uh, strategic uh, agency should be boosted because this reveals uh, um, disinformation webs. As part of the sanction package uh, in the spring, there was a ban uh, on some uh, disinformation websites. Of course, these uh, websites were banned and we have to keep doing it. We have to keep revealing these uh, platforms and ban them, Russia Today and others. So put it in a nutshell, this is an extraordinary situation and we need to be strong here what uh, uh, the mayor of Mariupol said, uh, together we are stronger and I b believe that we can manage if we are strong together and if we are uh, courageous in the solutions. We don't have to be afraid, we are facing uh, a rival who, uh, who, uh, has, uh, who uses any tools, any means, and we need to have a legal framework, we need to follow the system of law, but we need to use strong tools. Thank you. Thank you so much, very thorough, and uh, I fully agree with everything you're saying. I think we all have a story similar to the taxi driver and the, and the misinformation. And I, I wonder, is it, is it a separate issue, but the disinformation on, on social media is even more rampant. Is this something that can be tackled in the same way with funding? We need to, do we think about that separately or together? 
do think, uh, you know, going forward, I think it's just important to to add it in to, to, uh, to tackling that disinformation. Uh, separate or, uh, or uh, together? With, with traditional media. Yeah. Mm. I think that we have to uh, use all the opportunities uh, which there are. I was speaking about uh, the European level and about the possibilities that uh, we have um, and we have to use these uh, resources together. And national states and regions and municipalities have uh, an excellent uh, possibility to uh, complement uh, these resources. I didn't say at the beginning that uh, in this uh, immigration crisis, NGOs played an important role, a crucial role, and they are being supported from the EU but the immediate support that is needed uh, for language uh, education of uh, refugees and their children and uh, people who need to enter the labor market. For that, we need to use the local resources. At the EU level, there's uh, the Erasmus uh, program, which was uh, doubled and it is used by universities, uh, but it can also be used for the education of journalists and media people, and then there is a Creative Europe and Cohesion Funds. There is a lot of tools available at the European level, and they have to couple with national resources. Um, now I'm moving on to Elena. I don't know if I can see her there. Thank you. Um, now, um, Elena, you're the director of this, the Centre for Foreigners of the South Moravian region, and your mission, if I'm correct, is to help foreigners on their journey into integration and into Czech society. Um, we've already mentioned that the Czech Republic is on the front line tackling the refugee crisis. Czech Republic is a, is a transit and a destination country and the, with the third highest number of registered Ukrainian refugees after Poland and Germany and the highest number per capita. Um, so it, with that in mind, could I ask you, could you please describe the key services provided by your centre in helping foreigners on their journey of integration into society here? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak here and uh, to present uh, what uh, we do uh, here in the South Moravian region and at our center and uh, what we are still doing in support of uh, the people from the Ukraine. After uh, the presentation of uh, uh, the mayor of Mariupol, it is difficult for me to speak because uh, uh, they reminded me of all the photos of uh, refugees uh, in the first weeks of the war, uh, the first weeks of uh, March. I was there uh, with my team and uh, these were really very difficult times. I myself am a mother of two and uh, for me it was very demanding emotionally to uh, see these people uh, escaping uh, with the fear in their eyes and uh, with also questions in their eyes about uh, their future. So on behalf of my center, I'd like to thank mainly the governor of uh, this region because uh, what we are doing here in the South Moravian region is uh, mostly his doing and uh, it is uh, thanks to him and uh, the rescue services in the South Moravian region who were the first to intervene and uh, they started uh, helping the newcomers immediately through the crisis staff. The crisis staff uh, is working on a participative uh, base and it incorporates uh, the rescue system and uh, we uh, represent uh, uh, NGOs and we are still a part of this staff and I believe that it is extremely important to be there. 
Our center has had 13 years of experience in integration, and we are in a network of integration centers that are supported by the Ministry of Interior, and we are a network supporting integration services for people coming from abroad. Our center has been supporting language skills and assistance in legal and social affairs, we support job um, seeking, we help to integrate children in schools at all levels, all the way up to universities. We participate in uh, networking and uh, coordinating uh, integration services uh, within the region, but also within the entire Czech Republic. With regards to the situation in Ukraine and um, speaking about what we managed to do in the first days for the newcomers, I will also follow up on uh, what Michaela Shoydrova said. Our biggest effort was to ensure the most relevant information for the newcomers as well as for their members of families and friends and also for the public at large, because uh, the help that was available needed to be communicated. And we didn't want any distorted information about uh, the available help, because uh, uh, the distorted information might even harm the newcomers. In the first days, we saw that some services were misused and we had to communicate clearly that all services and all information provided is free of charge and that all the processes uh, which started at the assistance center are free. And uh, we had to communicate that this was a safe place where the newcomers will be helped. As Maria Nurechka mentioned, thanks to the fact that in each region there was an assistance center it is possible to take care of everything that uh, the newcomers need. And that is of key importance because uh, when these persons come to the assistance center, they get uh, the chance to live in the Czech Republic. They can enjoy all the rights of uh, people living here in the South Moravian region. In cooperation with the, the center, we try to ensure the integration services, that is uh, the language. And just to give you an idea, from March to June, thanks to the financial support from the European funds and the Ministry of Interior, we were able to open more than 40 Czech language courses. And uh, we have over 600 graduates from these courses, both children and adults. And in terms of the integration services, it is important to continue uh, providing advisory services because people need to know what to do next. Most of the time, these people in the first days, thanks to the assistance center, uh, have uh, somewhere to stay. And we also help them with accommodation. Nonetheless, the subsequent services and subsequent questions about where they can get medical aid, where they can get uh, doctors for their families, uh, how to place children uh, in schools, uh, how to get a job. All this is the activity of our center. And this is uh, where we do the integration service. Thanks to the cooperation with important institutions and NGOs and uh, employers and uh, chambers of commerce, we are able to Uh, create systems so that the help doesn't go to individuals only, but to groups of newcomers. There are many activities we do, and uh, I want to stick to my time limit, so I will not uh, mention any more. Nonetheless, 
For us, this situation is a challenge and an opportunity to show that uh, the functioning of a center at the regional level has uh, great importance. It is important as a coordinator, networker, and uh, an institution that uh, brings people together and uh, coordinates uh, the newcomers uh, with the, the local services and institutions. In the first weeks, we uh, witnessed uh, a great wave of support uh, from the local people to the Ukrainians, uh, both the new coming and the, the ones that have already been established here. And uh, it was our effort to make sure that uh, the, long, the wave lasted as long as possible. Now it seems that the situation in Ukraine will not be over so soon and it feels that uh, the wave of solidarity is uh, fading because uh, there is a surge of other complications in our lives and as uh, Mrs. Shoydrova mentioned, we are beginning to struggle against uh, a wave of uh, inacceptance. We are already facing discussions like, uh, isn't it too much what we do for them? Don't we do it at the cost of our own people in uh, the Czech Republic or other foreigners living here for a long time? I still believe that this help uh, should not uh, be reduced uh, until the situation calms down in Ukraine. Thank you to the regional government uh, for their persistent uh, will to help. It's extremely important for us to uh, support the newcomers and uh, make them feel welcome and safe. I want them to get all the assistance and support and at the same time I want to ask if uh, we manage to open the door uh, and uh, loosen the rules, uh, for example, for placing children in schools and in supporting uh, uh, language skills uh, or support uh, when entering the labor market, we should start discussing whether this uh, uh, support could be open also to other foreigners coming to the Czech Republic, not only the Ukrainians. Maybe this support should be av made available to everyone uh, from Ukraine living here even before the war. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alina, for an insight into the really important work that um, your centre is doing. It's, uh, it's really heartening, I think, to see that you've got graduates already from the language um, programme that you've run. So that's really great news because we've already discussed how important that is. Um, now, I'm going to start with a second round of questions for our panellists. Um, if I could just ask you, as it's the second round, to be a little bit more conscious of time, um, if you don't mind, um, because we have a, a limit on, on how we can go. Um, Marina, I'm, I'm back to you with the second question, and I just want to go back um, to ask you to expand on something that we discussed in the initial round, and that is the integration of working age Ukrainians into the labour market how you've already mentioned how unemployment is very low but how has that integration gone have have the czech people been accepting in general and how how easy has it been for them to to find work if you don't 
Děkuji, tak já... Well, thank you. I think that the adaptation and integration process in the Czech Republic is quite successful. We are doing quite well. Of course, uh, the labor market has a huge free capacity, which is a great advantage, as I said at the beginning. But uh, we have objective barriers because, of course, first and foremost, some of the accommodation capacities that we need to be flexible in providing is provided in localities when there is no not much, uh, uh, not much, there are not many job opportunities. So we need to make some internal reallocation so that the people can stay in those localities where there is job offer, but they, where they can also get accommodation and where we also have uh, capacities of school and preschool institutions. So it's not that simple. Of course, we are somehow dealing with that right now, but slowly but surely we will be doing quite well and address this solution. Of course, the great uh, challenge is the language education, the language skills. This is one barrier. Of course, uh, now we have companies who are going to be active in that and we support their activity if they want to have uh, their own uh, operation uh, language um, courses. We have a new operational program. These activities can now be covered by the EU funds. Uh, it's called OP Plus. And of course, we also try to encourage these activities uh, at uh, universities, NGOs uh, that could also uh, that are already contributing. We have a number of NGOs providing language courses at the various levels, uh, scouts, all these uh, youth associations. So it's a, a, a wide uh, community of NGOs being involved in this. But we also have some uh, legislative barriers, and this is quite a challenge in Europe because we need to be able to harmonize the approaches how to approach the recognition of university degrees. Uh, of course, uh, uh, practical experience in the field of healthcare, social care. We want to have uh, qualified nurses and uh, doctors, so we should learn from the situation now. And uh, as regards um, European countries and uh, as regards bilateral agreements that the EU is going to negotiate, we also have to touch upon this issue. This would also help the labor market a lot in the future. So this is one great appeal that I'm transferring to other uh, colleagues at the European level because we should really move forward in this field. And then if I come back to what I've said before, which is the question of the funds. Well, I've been trying to communicate it with all partners at the European level, and I'm trying to provide one argument. The money we have in the EU budget for cohesion, the money that we uh, invested after COVID to the, new to the national restoration plans, this is money allocated for the issues we have that are described and that should be dealt with. And we also need some funds uh, uh, for costs associated with the current refugee crisis. And it will be very difficult to explain to the voters anywhere in Europe, telling them that now we will take this money from the cohesion fund, from the National Restoration Plan, and they will be allocated to dealing with the situation. And the original problems, the original priorities we had, uh, the, the money will be missing. And the people will ask for answers. So uh, what about the dig digitalization? What about the development in the development of infrastructure? What is the development in a, a better social uh, care system? And we'll be in a situation saying, well, the movement will not be so uh, significant because we had to spend some money on the, low, on the current situation. And of course, um, it's not really uh, well balanced in all the EU countries. So I would very much like to appeal in this forum of EPP. This is something we should not neglect. And we need to have uh, addressed help for uh, countries that really have high cost right now. On behalf of the Czech Republic, I can say that just in the social system, starting from the beginning of, the, of this crisis, we have 10 billion crowns. Uh, uh, which is cost to allocated to help the refugees, and of course we have other costs of the social uh, healthcare system and so on. So uh, by this, I want to close, and I would think to I want to thank all those that are involved because this is the topic uh, how Europe shows how it means to live in practice. These are. Uh, European values based on Christian and Jewish values. We have never been exposed to a situation when we would have to be so fast and demonstrate our European values and live the values. So um, I hat off to all those who, uh, who contributed to that. Thank you so much, Mariam. Uh, uh, on to Elaine again. Um, 
And also touching back to something that we mentioned in the initial round, um, have there, and we talked a bit about the education system and how you've been taking them in at preschool age and, and throughout the older years. Has, the, has that impacted the capacity of your education system? I know in Ireland we are very, very short on preschool places. Um, I really admire the, the, the way other countries have reached out and offered places. I know that in Ireland if, it, it's a real struggle to, to find places for anybody. Um, have, has the influx of refugees impacted on your capacity as a whole? On the other hand, um, the national level is responsible, so they are placing people. So in the beginning, we were having our own uh, cottages, but we also had people in private care, so we took in everybody and tried to, to place them. So yes, it's tough in a way. Uh, but I still want to say something, uh, because times are changing, it's very tough. Uh, earlier, we had to have conferences, all of us, talking about challenges for Europe with an elderly population, we can't found labor. The problem in Europe is not finding labor, it's the mismatch. It's the mismatch of what the companies need and what the labor can give. So we all in this room, and also national level and European level, we have to think different. For instance, after the Second World War, when well, all the men in America went to war, the women went to factories. So, if I look in Europe, we have a lot of blank spots where we can't find uh, people. We have to think that women, mostly in this case there are women, can also work in some sectors where are male dominated. We can see it in Sweden, we have a lack of uh, truck drivers. We have a lot of young women driving uh, big, big uh, trucks and so on, and they are making a lot of money too, because it's a lack of them. So we have to create educational uh, benefits so that it's all disposal for men and women to choose uh, to uh, have adult education. Of course, you can turn in your, your, your university degrees if you have one, but if you haven't had one, then it's like, it's going to be very hard. And as long as they don't work, they don't contribute as we want them, and then we can see a division when it's harder financial times. We could lead to racism and people don't want maybe to engage in the same way. Uh, so if we are going to un keep Europe united, and we need, I mean, the pandemic and this war is an eye-opener. Come on, we have been so naive. We have been in this dream, oh, it's like, oh, they don't mean bad. I mean, we're the last standing big democracy. We have to stand up, it's gonna be tough, but we have to think in new ways, not the narrow mind. So we're gonna have to try new things that we haven't tried before. We will fail, of course, but we will learn from that and move forward. So I think, look at this as possibilities, because crisis opens your eyes and also forces you to rethink. We have to rethink about China. We have to rethink about Russia. Well, nobody's th thinking about, we have to rethink Europe, European values, and they come at a price. So this price, if we don't stand up now, our children will pay for it by not being free, living in a free world. So have that in mind. Very well said. I think we do need to challenge our perspectives on the, the truck driver is an amazing example. I wouldn't, I don't, I don't know any female truck drivers and it's amazing to know that there's, I know they are do earn a lot of money so maybe we'll start a recruitment campaign in Ireland but it's, it's we, we need to challenge our perspectives and, and change the way we go going forward. Um, Michaela, I'm back to you. Oh no, Emil, I'm on to you, sorry, apologies. Um, may I ask you based on, excuse me, <coughs> Based on your experience, is there a need for additional flexibility in mobilizing cohesion funds 
from the period 2021 to 2027 for the integration of Ukrainian citizens? I'd be very briefly, and I would like to emphasize two ideas mentioned by uh, Madame Shodrova and also from the Deputy Prime Minister of Czech Republic. First, we have to pay attention about the cohesion funds. We need fresh money in order to deal with refugees, and we need to keep the cohesion funds for their initial aim. As uh, uh, Mihaela said, uh, the Vice Prime Minister, we need infrastructure, digitalization, decarbonization, and so on. We cannot burden all the pressure just on cohesion funds to take and deal with uh, refugees. So that's important to understand at the European level. For that, we need fresh money. The second idea, it's exactly what it's written here in this document. Call to grant EU cities and regions direct access, access to e-funding for migration and integration. Care facility and what uh, Mayor of Warsaw and is here and he mentioned many times how important it is to deliver money direct to the local and regional authority because they are in the very front of the, of the crisis. And if you do not have a good collaboration at the national level, you have to spend the money and uh, maybe too late when you need that money to, to be back. So these two ideas I would emphasize. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Madam Shurdova, I may um, go back to something that I threw at you at the last round. Going back to social media, if I could ask you to a little bit about social media. Um, what do you think more can be done at a communication level, including through social media, to keep people's attention alive concerning the conflict. Now, we know that regions and cities do a lot, especially by linking the military developments in Ukraine with the direct impact that the war has on our societies um, and communities, but what do you think more can be done? I think it's a question for, <laughs> for uh, really, uh, for all of us, for all the government to be active, to face this, uh, this, uh, this information campaign. I will switch to the Czech language because I will speak about concrete Czech project. Mame uh, concrete. We have uh, specific Czech projects that help people to uh, navigate through what is true and what is not true. And at the European level, I already mentioned uh, several initiatives. That means uh, everybody at uh, the uh, member state level can be well informed about uh, what information is true and what is misinformation and uh, what we should avoid. However, in any case, I believe that uh, we have to be active in this and we have to actively show the truth and the reality and give positive, uh, good examples. In the Czech Republic, uh, there is an initiative called A Gift for Putin. Um, it is an open account where people gathered over 200 million Czech crowns for weapons and equipment and uh, defense uh, material with which we'd like to help the Ukrainian army to fight Putin. This is a civic initiative. This is something that shows that uh, citizens in the Czech Republic will understand what is going on in Ukraine. You asked about how to face uh, misinformation, how good we are at doing this. Uh, since we are having uh, regional representatives here and uh, people from the municipal level, you are also uh, administrators of educational institutions. So I'd like to ask you to make sure that information is provided at schools and that true 
rights for information is provided. Political uh, propaganda is uh, prohibited, but it is an obligation that uh, pupils and students get true and uh, objective information. So it is your job at uh, the municipalities because you are responsible for schools, uh, elementary schools and uh, secondary schools, you have to make sure that uh, these schools provide truthful information to their students. This is something that we are also pursuing at the level of the European Parliament. Uh, we have uh, exchange of practice uh, about how people educate in various countries. Maybe if I may touch on this issue about the structure of immigrants, 36% are young people who are at schools. And the capacities in Sweden and in the Czech Republic uh, need to be extended, of course, but we do have a reserve in the capacity. So it needs to be said that uh, for us this is an opportunity to educate and rejuvenate our society. So I see this as an opportunity uh, with the new students and new teachers. The minister said that we should harmonize the professions and uh, the recognition of uh, qualifications. Of course, that is a challenge, but we know from practice that uh, Ukrainian mothers and Ukrainian students are very hardworking. We know from employers that uh, if they want uh, help, if they need uh, work, Ukrainian uh, employees are always willing. So there is good experience with these people, and this needs to be emphasized. I believe that uh, the fight against uh, disinformation is uh, not uh, there for the first time, you know, that Brexit was also very much affected by it, by it and uh, the European Parliament uh, deals with it on an ongoing basis. But it is up to each and one of us uh, to take advantage of our competences and provide truthful information. And we have to draw attention to these issues. So this is what we have to do. Thank you so much. And I, you're dead right. We all have a responsibility in this room, I think, to, uh, and a big responsibility. So thank you so much. Um, I am finally going to Alina for the last question. Um, you spoke at length about what, what your uh, services you're providing um, in your uh, centre, but could I ask you, because it's been a, a few months now and you have experience prior to this obviously as well, what are the main lessons that you and your colleagues have learned from this current refugee crisis? Well, thank you for the question. Definitely, uh, uh, I will have to repeat it. To us, what is quite important is uh, to have the experience in uh, uh, getting the most relevant information so that we can get the relevant information to all the incoming refugees and to all those who are in touch with the uh, foreigners. Information is uh, what uh, uh, I want to encourage Mrs. Uh, Shoydrova in this effort. This is what can ensure the safe stay and uh, the functioning of our society. Uh, in all uh, respects, because uh, if we have uh, true information available and if we move forward, or oh, sorry, if we uh, transfer the information to the citizens, so uh, to the uh, foreigners, so that they know their rights and duties related to their stay in the Czech Republic, well, this is how to make sure that there will be no uh, disinformation, uh, misleading uh, ways, and we will make sure that uh, we will avoid that the uh, foreigners do not really understand what their rights and duties are. Uh, 
So, of course, uh, we have to make sure that uh, we can all live uh, uh, safely together. So, our main challenge is to make sure that we get the information and we transfer the information to all the stakeholders, to all the uh, all those who enter the integration system. What is also highly important is to uh, keep. Uh, uh, the interconnections at the local level, uh, both with the NGOs, with the public sector, with the public authorities, uh, with the employers, and with the chambers of commerce. Because uh, we really need to keep interconnecting. We need to keep informing about the expectations and the possibilities. And uh, to us, this is the only way to ensure efficient coordination and integration for uh, in favor of all of us. Last but not least, it's also important to look at the barriers that are being uh, established uh, with the uh, new people coming from abroad. We need to see how we can reduce the barriers so that it's fair uh, towards uh, the, the local citizens and so that it also enables uh, quality life of the newcomers. I mainly speak about the language barriers and of course uh, when entering the labor market it's our effort to communicate uh, towards the labor offices, the rep resp uh, representatives of the Ministry of uh, um, Social Affairs, what we deal with when we need to uh, engage the, um, the people in the education process. Uh, so we want to be sure that uh, the newcomers do not have only unqualified jobs, but we want to employ their um, uh, professional um, professional background so that they can work in positions that are fully qualified for and where we lack our staff. So I mainly speak about the area of health care and the schooling system and social care. This is where the people are needed most. Another great challenge is uh, uh, the area of uh, language education. And it's very important to uh, get uh, enough funds uh, for the language courses, for the language education in, uh, in the Czech language, because uh, the people, are, if they are going to speak Czech, if they are fluent in Czech, this, this will make them more independent. And there are many things they can organize themselves uh, in the Czech Republic. So uh, that's uh, uh, about it uh, from my part. And thank you very much for inviting us uh, today. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Amazing panel this morning. I think um, you'll all agree each one of them gave us uh, so much to think about and to learn from this morning. So thank you all very much for, for joining me this morning. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.
Hi, everybody. I'm sorry. I think I gave everybody the false impression that we're having a break. Um, if we could all return to our seats, that would be fantastic for the, for the final part of our, our program. And um, take a couple more selfies and then we'll all get back to our seats. And um, I promise there will be lovely refreshments to come after the conclusion of the final part of the program. So our panel is assembling on the stage and if we could all um, get back to our seats please. What can you do? They'll come back. They'll come back in a second. Welcome everybody to um, the final part of our program. If anybody is still standing and would like to come back into the room, that would be very much appreciated. Um, in any event, I will introduce our um, final part of this, uh, this morning's program, and that is um, to discuss regions as hubs for innovation. And we have a wonderful panel here this morning. Um, so I'll begin with our, our um, introduction to this part of, uh, of the event. Um, dear participants and dear speakers, innovation strengthens local resilience and improves our local community's capacity to face emergencies. It also protects citizens and supports local economies. I believe this is precisely why a shared regional vision needs to be grounded in an analysis of regional strengths and weaknesses. The Committee of the Regions has always called for enhanced innovation in every region and in every country connecting with each other. And after all, the core challenges for regional innovation policies are to ensure a favorable environment for entrepreneurship and business growth to create jobs stronger co cohesion and boost competitiveness. However, today we cannot debate innovation without mentioning the fact that we're still recovering from the COVID pandemic and that energy prices have been rising at an unprecedented rate. Both crises have primarily affected the business sector and in particular the SMEs. Small businesses are the backbone of the EU industry and represent the first employer in Europe. Today, for example, 70% of SME owners believe that the rising energy prices will impact severely on the growth and existences of their businesses. 
So far, nearly two thirds of companies in the EU spend between five and 20% of their total expenditure on energy, on energy. When utility prices are high, and they are getting higher and higher, and the winter is approaching, it has a dramatic effect on overall business costs and priorities. On top of that, SMEs often still cannot afford significant investments in innovation and generally have no connections or poor connections with research hubs. In times of crises and high prices, innovation policies risk being the first ones to be sacrificed. Before concluding my introduction and passing the floor to our distinguished guests, let me congratulate the Czech Presidency for including among their priorities the principle that the internal market needs to be further deepened also by supporting science, research and innovation. And in a moment, we will debate this in greater detail. Um, now, I am going to begin with Marku um, Mokula, the president of the Helsinki region. Uh, dear Marku, over the last 15 years as an experienced rapporteur on innovation policies, and also as the president of the core, you have dedicated yourself to the promotion the support and the development of a role for regions and cities in creating effective innovation ecosystems and making smart, smart specialization work. You've tirelessly stressed the need for strong and ambitious interactions between research, private investments and good public governance. With these three elements combined in a way to be of mutual support. So can I ask you, in your experience from ESPU and the Helsinki region, how do you consider current EU innovation policy stacks up in delivering concrete changes on the ground, especially across the connectivity and next generation skills, green urban planning and energy efficiency areas? Is it, all of this realistically affordable in the context of an energy emergency? Uh, okay, um, um, dear Emma, thanks for the question and uh, dear all my EPP colleagues. So it's really great honor as well to be here in this uh, amazing building and meeting room where the decisions have been done already for centuries. But l let me um, refer first to the previous panel debate because uh, you you most of you you are aware, very well aware that Finland is a very special country now with respect to Russia. I have we and we have the history with Russia how to live along and the Soviet Union as well. We have 1344 kilometers long joint border on the land with Russia. And that means that we need to find the innovative solutions, how to operate in certain cases, certain circumstances. And as well now, when we are discussing in Europe, partly also in Finland, so should we slow down the energy transformation to green and uh, digital? We actually, we large, large majority in Finns, we came to the conclusion, no, just the opposite. We need to speed it up. We need to accelerate all those and use this enormous opportunity that this will be the new beginning for a carbon neutral Europe. That means that uh, when we had defined already in many cities in Finland, we had defined our carbon neutrality roadmaps to 2030, including ESPO, we did that already more than five years ago, that that is our target year and we will make that to happen. Now, uh, a year ago, also Helsinki Capital, which we are next to that, ESPO, we formed the joint uh, capital metropolitan region. So Helsinki made the same decision. We know that they have more difficulties than us, uh, and everywhere there are difficulties. But this is a clear target. And that means that we need to work more together with industry, with get, get the companies to invest in research and development, new innovative solutions using modern technology, but as well looking that from the societal perspective. So societal innovations are crucial on, on, on this development. And uh, Emma, when you asked, <laughs> stress my personal experience. So I definitely want to encourage all of us to be 
poli as politicians, the foreigners, we need to be a few years or 10 years ahead of most of the others and show that we can make that. But it means in practice, so getting committed on certain kind of break breakthrough innovations which have a strong political flavor. In the 90s, uh, when the EU had the European Year of Lifelong Learning, 96, so I was the Finnish campaign uh, director inside Finland, at that time a member of the parliament, but committed on showing what does this lifelong learning mean, because that was part of my own professional background. And then in the parliament they started to call me Mr. Lifelong Learning. Uh, good, because then people knew that, uh, that I know a lot and I can encourage the other, others to do that. Later on, five years ago, I had as well learned and realized that innovation is the key instrument, not only for experts, but for policymakers, politicians. And innovation should be our key word. And now it's more timely than ever to do the same at the EU level. So at the turn of the, the, the millennium, we introduced uh, this innovation as the key word for all the members of the parliament, or close to all. Not all accepted that, but a large majority. And we created a special committee for the future inside the parliament. All parliaments, yours as well, in all countries, you have a committee for science, you have a committee for foreign affairs and so on. But we wanted to invent the future as well. So we created that, had the vote at the parliament to establish that on a permanent basis, and the majority was in favor of that uh, proposal, against actually the original proposal not to have future on a permanent basis, but just when we need the future. So these kind of initiatives now need to be taken on the local and regional level. And I think this is crucial. Uh, and, uh, and now let me refer and link to this uh, one thing that I can help, I think, most of you as well, because uh, during the summer, the COR, uh, thanks to Simone and a couple of the others, negotiated in Chaba Walbury and so on. So we got myself to be the rapporteur for the new innovation agenda for Europe. And that is very important because that's increasing financing to what you, Emma, said about the SMEs, so startups and cross companies, how to have more pub, uh, private investments as well for that. Uh, that is one of the priorities clear there. Another is to that we need to uh, experiment, uh, look the whole innovation process, experimenting, piloting, testing and sharing with the others, and that's a crucial. The third one is especially on the deep tech valleys. And here, uh, uh, this deep tech, it, it does not mean such just uh, one new technology, but it's above all others, it's a societal transformation. How to have multidisciplinary uh, innovations, how to take the best out of the new knowledge, and integrate, create this synergy for this deep tech development. And uh, yesterday I contributed uh, and uh, participated uh, virtually on the meeting of Commission Joint Research Center and the COR and, uh, and our <clears throat> many of our regions uh, on these partnerships for regional innovation, where, by the way, with Emil Bock, Klusnapoka, uh, Espo, Eindhoven, Leuven, a couple of the others. We are one of the regions who are especially focusing on this uh, uh, climate neutrality, smart city development, the EU mission. So I contributed there, and uh, Maros Sefkovic, the uh, Commission Vice President, stressed that this instrument, the new deep tech valleys, as a new instrument to reach the European targets. And deep means, above all, tackling societal challenges by using multidisciplinary knowledge, bio to food, material circularity, new renewable energy solutions, digital and artificial intelligence on all processes. And my city and my region, Helsinki, we are the forerunners in these thought-provoking transformations. And that experience we definitely want to share in practice as well. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Marku. And um, this is in no way related to your wonderfully comprehensive answer, but I should have stated at the outset, if I could just remind all, this, all the panelists to stick to our, our time limits, that would be fantastic. But thank you so much for your wonderful answer. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to Mr. Schmidt now. And um, I believe you have a, a video that you want to share with us as well um, after the question, but I'll, I'll just address the question to you first. Um, Saxony is a, a true inv innovation stronghold. Um, the creativity and innovative spirit of the Saxons has always been the driving force of your economy. In order to maintain prosperity, regional authorities have the mission to strengthen and support innovation ecosystems in a targeted and strategic manner. So in your view, how can we boost innovation in Europe? What can be the role of regions? And very importantly, can you give us an example of how you foster innovation in your region? Ja, vielen Dank. Auch von mir. Das ist das Thema, was wir besprechen und well, I'm happy to have a chance to be here today, and that's a topic that I want to talk about today. Well, we need to define exactly, if we talk about sustainability, about innovation, uh, we need to really define what is understood by this term in relation to the inflation. And innovation are only created if uh, you introduce them as a standard in all kinds of areas of the social life and uh, if uh, these innovations are achieved. So uh, science research and uh, the promoters, supporters, it's the businesses, uh, citizens, those who take measures that result in innovations. So uh, people who uh, introduce uh, new technologies, uh, for example, uh, those who uh, develop screens or TVs with a new generation of screens. And uh, if uh, we are doing well, if the innovations uh, are to be influenced, then we need to do it in a in an informed way. How do we uh, find ways to reach such innovations? How can we reach the innovation and how uh, we could do it at the national level, at the state level? We as the representative of the state, we talk about innovation always in dependence on the standards, on the norms. And this concerns not only mobility, e-mobility, but it stre stretches all the way to quality. So if we want to achieve these results, we need to activate people who can contribute to that. So this means researchers, scientists, businesses, providers of services, and of course, uh, all um, uh, those working in the public institutions. And we need to uh, make a network so that such a network can uh, uh, operate across the country so that we can create solutions and we look for solutions. And that's why we have developed this platform, the objective of which is to look for solutions and uh, Uh, besides, uh, we also have some random meetings, I call it random meetings, ad hoc meetings between the politicians, the all kinds of stakeholders, and in Saxony we have uh, established an, initi an initi initiative, Innovation Hub. That's, uh, it's called Simul Plus, uh, Simul from Latin, which expresses uh, uh, unity, connection, plus as an expression of some extra value, added value. This principle was uh, formulated by Mr. Schumberger, who is speaking about creative uh, distru disruptors. And uh, what we talk about here is uh, sustainability. And uh, 
the one who proposed that he, he comes from the Czech Republic, the author comes from the Czech Republic. That's why I'm happy that we have this event organized in the Czech Republic. This initiative is based on three pillars. First is the exchange of uh, uh, knowledge starting from small meetings all the way to large conferences. Of course, uh, uh, it's about e-mobility. It also focuses on other uh, technological topics. And uh, in total, we need to uh, communicate uh, the exchange of uh, experience. Uh, the, the initiative is uh, supported. Uh, and the second pillar is the Initiative Plus. This is where the men in the street can meet. And of course, uh, people can, uh, it, this uh, pillar also engages uh, entrepreneurs. And then uh, this pillar is used to share the innovative experience. We can even provide grants from 5,000 euros up to higher amounts, but the objective or oh, the main objective is to make sure that the people meet, that they can network, so that they can exchange the experience, so that they can uh, stop and think how they can co contribute to their region, and so that they can build up trust to this cooperation. So even if uh, this initiative is organized as a competition and no one uh, gets the award, still, still you can have a have a feeling that you assisted with a good idea. And the third pillar is uh, um, uh, concrete model projects, all the way from lab projects to projects that deal with the current uh, topics, uh, such as the wastewater treatment, uh, a circular economy, recovery. And of course, this is something that is uh, supported by the Ministry of Environment and uh, large uh, research institutes. And um, we also cooperate with a number of initiatives uh, from the state uh, level, from the national level, down to the regional level. We want to be the catalyst. We don't want to um, prescribe anything. We know to boost, we want to promote, and uh, the, uh, we want to make sure that the ideas uh, that are uh, provided, we want to be sure that the ideas are spread and disseminated without uh, setting some restrictions, without exercising pressure on people. We want to make it possible for the people to develop their creative skills, and as a result, they can assist their regions. So as a result, this may develop, uh, it may create some energy, and we know that people themselves are the source of this energy. And that's why uh, this is a credo, a motto uh, that I would like to convey today. Uh, innovating. Uh, which should be the main motto. And we, as the regional representatives, be it the mayors or uh, presidents or members of parliament, we all are active in our regions. And at the European level, we met in the Committee of Regions so that we can, we can contribute to the day-to-day -day work, which in the EU, uh, will lead to new innovations that are highly important. And this can then encourage our European future. Thank you. A network of successful companies, renowned scientists, and modern administration. That's the Simul Plus Innovation Hub of the Saxon State Ministry of Regional Development. 
Simul comes from Latin and means together, achieving more together for a smart development in the regions of Saxony. Simul Plus is a platform that enables the discussion of new ideas in a context with a variety of different partners so that I can actually implement new ideas three to five years earlier than usual. We focus on solutions which are technically feasible, make economic sense and are accepted by society. With numerous projects, the initiative shows how companies and research institutions can successfully work together to introduce and develop new technologies and to contribute to economic growth in Saxony. Our objective is to establish a dialogue between science, business and municipalities and jointly implement the projects using their expertise. For me, Simul Plus is an excellent way to reach one's goal much faster with other like-minded partners. Smart projects for smart regions. That's the task we're tackling. Until now, we have always created innovations for the region. But the right way is to create innovations together with the region, with the companies and the institutions located here. Our topics cover all areas of innovation-based regional development. Our thinking is strongly oriented towards the future of our regions. For example, how can we harness the challenges of structural change to our advantage? Today, there is no better way to demonstrate how the transition from a former coal-based energy system to new decentralized energy systems is taking place. Towards a circular economy which protects resources and the climate. The common vision is that the European Showcase Center for a Circular Economy develops here. The digital transformation, one of the most extensive transformation processes in business and companies which permeates all spheres of life. How do we best take advantage of the possibilities of digital transformation? This is of utmost importance, also in view of bundling digital transformation competencies and, at the same time, not merely talking about it or networking, but also getting things on the road. Build digital competencies. Try out new digital solutions. The Simul Plus Innovation Hub, a platform for exchange and transfer which connects theory and practice. Simul Plus relies on a three-part intertwined structure with specialized conferences, workshops, competitions, model projects and test beds. European Digital Innovation Hub Saxony is the next milestone in order to comprehensively implement the digital transformation. Of course, the goal is to think beyond borders, because that's exactly where a lot of new areas open up. We live the international exchange of experience and intensify the collaboration with our European partners in order to implement joint projects. Achieving more together. The Simul Plus Innovation Hub for innovation-based regional development in the heart of Europe. Thank you so much, Minister Schmidt, for sharing that video. It's, it's like a glimpse into the future that's happening right now. So I think we can all take some inspiration. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move on to Radim Sursen. I hope the pronunciation is correct. Um, dear Radim, you have a, a double political role as Deputy Minister for Regional Development and Mayor of a small village. 
making your presence in this round table very specific and meaningful for the different perspectives that you can offer us. Um, innovation policies are often perceived as belonging to big research hubs and reserved to large companies and to the highest levels of governance. But in reality, multi-level governance is vital to enhance the coordination of regional, national and EU innovation policies. So with this in mind, as someone passionate about community-led local development, how do you see local communities being empowered to best take ownership of their development strategies? And how can we continue to fight red tape in a way that allows SMEs to reach new levels of growth at a time when many, there's many challenges and rising costs that we discussed earlier? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me welcome you here in the Czech Republic. It's a great pleasure that we can host here our friends from the Committee of the Regions. Although in this moment I am also the Deputy Minister of Regional Development of the Czech Republic, first of all I am a proud Mayor of a rural municipality already for 12 years and I am also a very proud member of the European Committee of the Regions and I am always engaged in issues like smart villages and the rural development and with that kind of passion I am trying also uh, to bring this topic on the level of the uh, Czech government and the presidency and uh, uh, I am also so happy that uh, the Committee of the Regions is coming so often now to the Czech Republic. This is our first session next week. Uh, on Friday we are going to meet in Prague for the Biro. Then we had a Smart Villages and Silali Conference in Lednice, which is a wine region very close to here. Then we have also SEDEC uh, Commission meeting in Brno and we have also Korlip meeting in Liberec. So many events of, uh, of the Committee of the Regions under the Czech Presidency. And I must say that also our Minister of Regional Development is very enthusiastic about the Committee of the Regions. And we are so happy on behalf of the government to have the Committee of Regions as one of the key partners. Um, as it was mentioned in the beginning, I very much do believe that every crisis is a huge challenge. And for me, uh, the two crises we are facing, COVID crisis and the war in Ukraine and consecutive energy crisis, it's a huge challenge for the rural areas because um, I think it can speed up the transformation of rural areas and bring the rural re revival much sooner than we would expect it in, if it was not like that. Because when I've heard smart villages five years ago, the godfather is Frank Bogovic, who is EPP member of European Parliament and my very good friend. Uh, so uh, we are thinking about it and the mayors were skeptical about it, you know, what are you bringing to the rural areas? But now everyone is thinking about the new tools, uh, about energy efficiency. Now after COVID already home offices are possible, you know, in any kind of business so the young people can stay in the rural areas and work from homes, etc, etc. And I, I, I think we should use this challenge and we should take the tools and policies from the European national to local level to try to bring the uh, rural areas in the, in the, in the heart of, of the development and to bring their uh, revival. It's also nice to hear that innovations are not connected just to big cities as it was used before, but uh, that we are now talking about also innovations in the rural areas. Rural areas are not a museum, as I'm always saying. Uh, they are also a very interesting place to live and very, having great potential to develop. Um, that's uh, uh, why I do think that combination of technologies together with innovative ideas, because smart villages is not just about the technologies, it's about new ways of thinking, like social innovations, etc., can uh, really, uh, and also the engagement of the community. Uh, we should also think about it that any kind of innovation should be like kind of bottom-up process you know it's not just about that some politician or someone say okay we'll do that I think we need to have kind of bottom-up approach so that people uh, feel to be engaged in the process and they are kind of uh, uh, having ownership of that so I think this is this is crucial especially if we are talking about innovations in the rural areas because we should persuade the people here I feel that the key role of the community-led local development and local action groups, as we do have also experience in the Czech Republic, is crucial because they are kind of innovation broker in the rural areas and they are able to work with all the sectors. It's uh, public sector, it's private sector and it's NGO sector. Uh, and of course, uh, support of the small businesses is key 
because of course uh, uh, rural areas are not just about agriculture, rural areas are about diversification and we do need to support like kind of innovations hubs and uh, business incubators and we are trying to establish them now also in the rural areas of the Czech Republic. Actually my local collection group Šumperský Venkov Actually, this is my village, it's about 120 kilometers north from here. So we are establishing in true rural area, we are establishing an innovation hub and, uh, and business incubator together with neighboring local action group and uh, with the city of Schumper. And we really want to keep also the urban uh, uh, rural linkages with that. And we really think that we need to support that also in a smaller cities and in rural areas, because uh, it's not the solution that it's those incubators are just in, in big cities. Second thing. We should use the technologies uh, and, of course, broadband infrastructure. Um, in Jesenik region, which is one of the most outermost regions of the Czech Republic, where the unemployment rate was the lowest, uh, the, the highest one in the Czech Republic, now is uh, piloting 5G for five cities project, which is really bringing 5G, which is bringing piloting telemedicine in this region. So women shouldn't travel 120 kilometers to Olomouc with the pregnancy diabetes, but they have uh, facilities at home they measure and uh, uh, the hospital and experts are just diag diagnosing it. And uh, we are also uh, piloting there those innovation hubs, etc., etc. So this is one of the regions. And what we find out is that the people are moving back to this region. It's not having the highest unemployment anymore, you know. And there is nice countryside. And there is also one guy who is having some kind of initiative, which is called Positive Yeah. And he's persuading people how sexy it is living in Essenik, how successful people live there, you know. And this is another that we have to build up the pride, the rural pride in the people. And um, so those are the tools we are trying to use. We have also association of local governments in the Czech Republic, which is putting together the small municipalities. And they are having a project which is called uh, um, Rural 2030. And they are bringing community energy solutions. They are bringing all the new technologies in transportation, etc., etc. So it's another tool, also association of, uh, of local governments. So to sum, sum it up, uh, I think it's, it's crucial to think about the development and innovations together because it's going hand to hand and innovations can help us to develop the least developed regions which are usually at the borders uh, for example with Saxony with Poland etc and we should use these uh, examples also to really booster this this policy on the European level actually our presidency we do have two events for this topic we really want to as much as possible pu push those uh, those uh, uh, those initiatives and I, I'm sure that uh, the committee of the regions as a, as a body which is uh, actually composed of the people from the bottom we should really use this opportunity to to push it so that really we can help uh, to the, also to the rural areas as it is in South Korea and, and other countries. Thank you so much, Radim, and it's really good to hear about innovations bringing life back into places that that might have been, you know, decreasing in population that are attractive again for people to live in and have a really good quality of life as well, I think, in the countryside, so it's great to see. Um, we're moving on to Miroslav Janowski. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, as part of your mission, your department has a strategic approach to the economic development of the region in the field of research and innovation. Um, it's a process of identifying the opportunities and strengths, Pardubi, uh, strengths in Pardubis, a region that can benefit from specialization in a particular field of science and technology. So can I ask, in your experience in this region, what are the EU funding programs that have helped to bring the greatest tangible changes to citizens, communities and businesses? Thank you for your, for your question. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak at this uh, conference. Uh, and of course, uh, for the opportunity to share experiences uh, from our and my region. Uh, so once we look at your question just through the facts and the figures, uh, the Pardubice region is amongst the two most successful Czech uh, regions in terms of the disbursement of EU funds uh, converted to per capita uh, per inhabitant. 
Until 2021, we have made use of about 50 billion crowns uh, in our within our region, and it's quite interesting that if you look at the details of these facts and figures, most funds have been allocated to business support, which is quite interesting because, of course, we speak very much about the funds uh, that are still allocated to road reconstruction, uh, hospital reconstruction, but the greatest share of the funds in our region are allocated to business support. The Padubice region unfortunately does not have a, a center such as uh, the South Moravian Innovation Center and that's why for the time being we uh, as regards our uh, activities in innovations have to be somehow replaced but uh, our main project that we would like to prepare for the new period which is up and running is um, the construction and establishment of the Padubice Innovation Center and we are very happy happy that we can collect experience from the South Moravian region. I'm very happy to see, the, uh, I'm very happy to get some experience from Saxony because of course I could also get experience from the university and uh, if you look at how we can combine and interconnect the inter, uh, individual companies, businesses, how we can interconnect the university sector and businesses and universities together. And I believe that one of the greatest contributions, if we talk about the contributions uh, how to, uh, uh, that are brought by the EU funds, is the effort to uh, make sure that we can develop uh, investments where the individual partners closely communicate with each other and we really need to cooperate. So just to give you a specific example, my colleague Mr. Sersheny knows that for many years I have been uh, enforcing an, uh, integrated territorial investments and we achieved something extraordinary in our region. If you have the two largest cities in our area, uh, Pardubice, so the city of Pardubice and the city of Hradec Králové, this is an area with 300,000 people and five universities. What is interesting that these universities, before we wanted them to have this common approach, they didn't communicate at all. They were uh, uh, like preserved, uh, encapsulated, and they could not really imagine a narrow cooperation between uh, themselves and cooperation with businesses within the region was of a very low level. And the funds were like the driving force, but thanks to the funds, that the universities and businesses could uh, use, we managed to uh, set the cooperation in motion and start up the cooperation and we get uh, remarkable results out of this cooperation over the past five, six years. So right now, uh, to give you an example of the Padrobice University, we are very strong in chemistry and in cooperation with other three universities, and of course with the private companies we they develop materials that are already tested thanks to the european cosmic agency and they are tested in the universe already we have a great potential concerning our region and i don't know if you are aware of it the city of pardubice is the heart of radio locator technology in europe and perhaps globally in pardubice uh, they have developed radio locators that uh, in 1990 could uh, detect invisible American American stealth fighters and uh, thanks to these companies uh, that keep developing this area and thanks to the universities that are engaged in uh, electromechanics uh, and uh, other fields of engineering we are really a great uh, we are at the cutting edge of Europe and I believe that the European funds uh, have really assisted us in ensuring the cooperation so it doesn't really have to be about the tangible results but it's also about the cooperation that uh, my colleague from Helsinki was talking about. This is a key topic and uh, um, a, a small uh, European success we have achieved thanks to a project with we, which we implement using uh, EU funds uh, Smart Accelerator. We have developed an application which is uh, mainly used by students and pupils, primary school pupils, who decide uh, how to continue studying and it also helps their parents and this is an application that can 
uh, you have tests and it uh, shows you uh, what skills the pupil has where the students could continue their studies and uh, then it also indicates to the stu students at primary schools uh, where the steps could be uh, then diverted in uh, the local companies. This is an exceptional um, app because you avoid going to the psychologists who uh, describe the skills of your children. So alone, uh, so, so, sorry, together at home with their parents, they can choose the best possible secondary school in their region, just sitting at home with their parents. And the application also shows the children what innovative companies are out there where they could work in the future. So I believe that these are uh, tangible uh, results of the EU funds well spent. Thank you so much. I, I learned a lot about Pardubica there. Thank you. It seems a great hope of innovation. Thank you very much. Um, now, I know Pedro has been patiently waiting um, all afternoon, but I just have one time-sensitive announcement from members just before I, I go to you, Pedro, if you don't mind. Um, just for anybody who um, was intending to get the shuttle at 13.30, at half past one, it's now leaving at 13.15 sharp to go directly. So if you could enter in the courtyard at 13.15 to go directly together to the Grand Hotel and then the airport shuttle will be going to Vienna from there. So it's 13.15 for anybody who is planning on getting the 13.31. And for the um, visit of Bruno, anyone who's going on that will be departing between 2 and 2.30, between 14 and 14.30 and we'll gather in a group at the backyard um, after lunch to um, do that. And then for the dinner this evening, you can arrive to the castle at 18.30 and it'll for, for, a, set, for a 1900 start. There's no need to have a ticket. Um, just at the entrance, there'll be a couple of people there and if you just mention um, EPP Brussels, you'll be allowed access. So the most important thing is anyone who is intending to leave at 13.30 to go at 13.15. Thank you so much. And thank you, Petra, for your patience. Um, <coughs> Petra Shadlek is the director of the South Moravian Innovation Centre. And your mission there is to support entrepreneurs to look after the development of an innovation ecosystem in the region. So first of all, this is meant to achieve a positive change in society address global challenges, but also to contribute to the development of internationally successful companies. So you, have, you yourself have written widely on regional innovation strategies and governance. Could you tell us something about the gradual transformations in this region's profile, moving to considerable biotechnology industries and the IT sector, while keeping strong traditional industries? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just would like to tell you a story about this region because you came here, you came to Brno, you came to South Moravia and um, as uh, it was introduced, um, I'm here uh, as a, a CEO of the South Moravia Innovation Centre which stands for the agency which was founded uh, almost 20 years ago as a result of the first generation of innovation strategy and it was founded by the, the city. You know, in this room it was decided that it will be founded then uh, by the uh, South Moravian region, uh, freshly established, and four universities. And um, those all six uh, partners agreed on a, on a common vision. I, I just, you know, you are leaders, you are political leaders, you know how hard it is to, to find a common way uh, among um, uh, strong institutions. And I just wanted to, to um, elaborate on that because I think it's quite exceptional. And I was asked about the transformation, but I think this is one of the, the most important thing what I want to uh, uh, deliver to you, is that here in South Moravia uh, and in Brno, we uh, do build up on this agreement and continually build up new, new things and, and, and try uh, to uh, tackle the challenges we face. Today, as all we are discussing and, and uh, feeling it very, very, very strongly, uh, that uh, we face uh, security challenges, we face 
uh, societal challenges we face, uh, climate change or CO2 uh, threats, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, I've got to say that, that here in South Korea we managed to, to face similar challenges or perhaps of uh, less of uh, global importance, but we did. Um, just the story is that, that 20 years ago the, the Brno faced quite un unemployment. There was like 12% of un unemployed people. Today you cannot imagine that. And uh, that leaders agreed to, to, to set up the, the uh, the strategy and to 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 do something in with the local economy, and uh, in that time there was a huge unemployment, but also we had a quite lowly developed innovation economy or the, the knowledge economy. In that time, we invested uh, slightly uh, more than one percent of uh, of uh, regional GDP into the R and D. Uh, those who knows these numbers, it's really low number. Today. Today we invest uh, almost three and a half percent of uh, uh, local GDP into R&D, and more than half is done by the companies. It's um, numbers compared to uh, quite uh, developed regions across Europe, uh, numbers which are not that far away from Israeli economy, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How we did it? I think, and and it, we've got to still repeat that we. We benefit so much from the EU integration, and then we enter the EU. In EU. And we, we, we've got to repeat that, and we, we've got to be very, very um, um, grateful for that. The second thing is that that um, it's not just of, because of money, but but it was just because of that we uh, had a brand of a stable economy and welcoming economy to towards the foreign direct investments. It's. Uh, Quite necessary to emphasize that, that here in the regions there is more than 30 foreign companies which do have own R&D here. So it makes a, a very robust, very very attractive environment for also foreign talent. And lastly, um, and I can't stress it more, it's uh, the, the way we do the things that we uh, do plan the things, we plan it together and we were able to agree on the common strategy and invest in the local people, into local entrepreneurs, startups, people, students which have, who has got uh, entrepreneur ideas and to support them. Today there is uh, hundreds and hundreds of new companies uh, which do perform quite well there are several candidates for unicorns. One is, is to be appeared next week. I cannot say this, that name yet, but, uh, but uh, it has happened. And I just wanted to share this story because, because today we do face these global challenges and we do believe at JIC, at the South Korean Innovation Center, that through support of entrepreneurs, we are able to, to deliver new innovative results to the people. And I personally, I'm pretty convinced that via entrepreneurs, we can, and via new technologies which, which are developed by entrepreneurs, it's important to stress it, it's by researchers, but second by the entrepreneurs. We can sort out also today problems, security problems, but also um, CO2 problems and climate change, etc. And I just want to uh, encourage you to think of still innovation policy. It was a strong political topic 10 years ago. Today we have got uh, uh, different topics, but the way, the, 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 the path to sort it is via uh, entrepreneurs and technology. It can help us, nothing else. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, now, we have a little time for one more question, but I have a serious challenge for the panel, and that is to answer my next question in a minute or under. So this is a challenge, and I hope you're willing to accept. So I'm going to start with you, Marku. Um, could you tell us about the EU City's mission and how the likes of SPU can tap into pilot projects and concrete actions with the period underway? Uh, for this, uh, it's impossible to say in one minute, but I'll just highlight a few things. So, because in ESPO as a case, so 
we have now the third four-year term of the city council that we have a special kind of multidisciplinary uh, political decision making body on this with uh, politicians from the council and, and as well top civil servants focusing especially on this sustainability and that is now closely linked to the European Union mission so how to tackle the climate change and that's why I can uh, kind of commit that we will have extensive good results by 2030 because now last uh, April we and the city board we approved uh, based on the proposal of this, uh, this special political committee, uh, the detailed around 50 pages of actions, how to make that to happen. Not what should be our target, but how we can implement. And everything happens with the local industry, with academia, with research centers, and based on the SDGs. So I've taken there a lot of what uh, like Ricardo Rio has introduced in the SDG opinions, but as well so that how we can motivate citizens, children from the schools to be part of this transformation process. And I think this is the reality. Everyone on board, pre prepare your local voluntary review programs. We have done that review processes. Uh, de deliver those to UN and others and there's a huge number of projects going on now how on this implementation and that's very much based on the kind of city contracts what the Commission EU missions are looking for so that we already have those but now we are deepening making them a bit more even concrete so that it helps also the others thank you thank you very much very close to a minute thank you <laughs> Um, Minister Schmidt, I'll move on to you, um, and I want to talk about Silicon Saxony. So, how do you see the assets and needs of states such as yours in the fields of research, talent and supply shortages? Yeah, uh, in, in Freistaat Sachsen have we an ausgeprägt uh, Well, uh, we are an area where we have a number of universities. So uh, we talk about Saxony, but mainly we have uh, uh, we have uh, lots of SMEs, and that's why we need to offer interesting uh, job opportunities so that the people can really find the job vacancies that suit their needs so that we can uh, they can concentrate on high-tech areas but uh, uh, we need to we also need to make sure that uh, they study what's needed and we also need to have uh, people educated like educated uh, craftsmen uh, people that are good at providing services to others and we need to give opportunities to them as well and to do so, of course, we need uh, to have funds. As regards small businesses, they need to be provided with uh, educated uh, uh, labor. We have to make sure that uh, the people uh, stay within the region and work for these SMEs, especially in rural areas, because uh, these are the rural areas where these, uh, these SMEs are located. And we need to uh, develop this. We need to get all the companies on board and we need to keep people there and diversify the, uh, the economy in the rural areas so, uh, so that this is not only something that is taking place in the large cities and large centers. And uh, in Saxony we are uh, of course known for the automotive and um, we have other fields of industry like uh, mechanical engineering and other areas that need to f uh, further develop. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, Radim, I was going to ask you how a question that you've already answered in some way, how the EPP can continue to lead the cause to stimulate conditions for young entrepreneurs and innovation of local businesses to stay and grow in rural areas. Well, you've spoken a, a bit about how, how they can grow in rural areas. Can you tell us more specifically about young entrepreneurs, what, what we can do to help them? Uh, 
I think we uh, do. Uh, I'm sure, first of all, that uh, rule development is kind of uh, DNA of EPP, you know, this is the party which is promoting those, is those issues. So we need to cooperate much more among different institutions, uh, together with European Parliament and uh, Commission and our representatives. Actually, one of the first steps on behalf of the Committee of the Regions is this uh, seminar we are having in Lednice because it's uh, organized together with European Parliament and the Rumra Intergroup. So I think this is first thing. Secondly, we should... Uh, push um, uh, all the policies and funding possibilities because, um, as I already mentioned and also Mr. Jurečka mentioned, uh, now we have a new tools of financing and of policies uh, uh, which, are watch, uh, which are looking at the rural development not just from the agriculture perspective but across all, whole funds, uh, all funds uh, and as, as a part of regional development. And through that, we should open the opportunities to young people and to small businesses in rural areas. We should fight with the red tape. I always call it bureaucracy because a lot of bureaucracy all around. So we should uh, help to the, to the small businesses and young people when they are launching the businesses with this. And we should also work with young people, with schools, you know. Uh, in the Czech Republic, we have a tool which is called Local Action Plans of Education, which is putting together schools, all kinds of schools, businesses, and public sector. And uh, it wor it's working, you know, because the people, the young people find out that they can do also qualified jobs in the rural areas and they can stay. And uh, uh, finally, uh, we really need to promote uh, all those possibilities and opportunities all around. And I think the only tool is really to do it from the bottom-up uh, approach, as I mentioned, uh, and uh, to put together on one board public and private and NGO sector. This is crucial. And also on the European level, uh, there was launched by this uh, Rumra Intergroup uh, from European Parliament, so-called Smart Villages Forum, which is actually putting together the local governments, politicians, businesses. And I think this is crucial because if we want to start the change, we need to have everyone on board. So I think we have a lot of opportunities, a lot of work, and, but we should try to bring all the European strategies in this moment, the long-term vision for rural areas, which is still in the sky. Everyone is watching it, but nobody is realizing it. So we should bring it from the sky to the earth and start to do things. I have to say you're all rising to the challenge very well here. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Yanofsky, um, I just you, you mentioned that um, Pardubica is a neighboring region to southern Moravia. Could you tell us something a little, a bit, little something about inter-regional cooperation in, in innovation? Well, to us, the South Moravian Innovation Center, well, in the Czech uh, Republic, it's been existing for 20 years, and to us, this is a, a driving force. It's a motivator uh, for us. Of course, uh, we know that we probably do not achieve such a standard in the upcoming two decades. We cannot really compare ourselves to the South Moravian uh, Innovation Center because the concentration of universities and businesses in research and development in Brno this is not present in our region, but it doesn't mean that we cannot really share and uh, get the good experience from them. Recently, we have implemented uh, some things that have been up and running in the South Moravian Innovation Center, such as creative vouchers. We cooperate uh, with a top expert who, he, who has been working in the South Moravian Innovation Center for a long time, and we talk with him about the marketing and innovation, Mr. Avrat, and we want to keep uh, implementing the platting program which is up and running in the South Moravian Innovation Center so there is a lot of experience to be transferred but we don't only want to focus on the South Moravian Innovation Center we are also starting cooperation with uh, uh, an incubator and innovation center in Wroclaw in Poland we are looking for experience wherever we can because we believe that uh, our region needs uh, such impulses and we believe that thanks to these impulses we can develop further and uh, we will be more and more successful in that. Thank you so much, Mr. Janowski. And Peter, the final question of the day goes to you. And can I just ask you if uh, foreign direct investment has played a role in your centre? Absolutely. Like for, for the region, it was, it was uh, crucial. Uh, I just have to say that since the year of two, 2000, 
uh, more than uh, 20,000 jobs, high-tech jobs, I've got to emphasize, was, was created by the foreign direct investments. It's, it's a huge number. But um, also these, these uh, FDIs, as we call them, uh, brought lots of more. Um, it's, um, it's a kind of, um, they are kind of antennas for uh, local companies to orient in the new markets and new needs uh, uh, across the globe because, because people in these uh, companies, uh, especially in the R&D centers, has good knowledge what um, will be a future market and, and uh, local companies are interconnected with these managers and so they learn from them. So, so it's a it's pretty, pretty tricky way how to, how to motivate um, uh, local, local startups to, to, to be um, more competitive. And um, last but not least, I want to emphasize that uh, these foreign direct investments, they, they educated ex actually uh, local force in terms of manager skills. You know, um, it, look, uh, here people did not have a possibility or the, 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 the opportunity to learn how to manage uh, sophisticated processes within the companies. And, and uh, these foreign companies taught so many people how to do product development, marketing, and et cetera, et cetera. And today we see that so many uh, these highly skilled professionals are now working in a local Czech companies on this on very high positions and they started in the FDIs in the foreign companies. So I, I've got to say that was probably the biggest, the biggest contribution to the local economy that we, has, we have got a, a hundreds of hundreds of professionals, otherwise we would not have them. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, that concludes this part of our, of our um, panel discussion and I just want to, want to thank another very distinguished panel for all the insights you've brought to us today. I think what we can all take away from this afternoon's discussion is that really cooperation and learning from each other, the heart of the European values are really what can help us all to thrive. And if we cooperate, teach each other and learn from each other that we can help our own economies to grow and uh, in turn help Europe to prosper. So um, thank you all so much for, for coming today and giving us all your very valuable insights and um, you can all return to your seats in the audience and I'm going to invite President Keblovich back to the stage when he's had a chance. So thank you again all of you. Okay, uh, dear friends, maybe it is not easy to sum up a, such a difficult discussion, I would say, but only a few remarks from this, uh, from this meeting, from this very important, I would say, meeting. Right now, all in Europe realized that Putin not only invaded Ukraine, he as well has started war with whole Europe, turning off valves of, on the gas pipes for European countries just to freeze Europeans during the winter, to defeat Ukraine and to win with us. But I'm sure that finally he will be a loser. We have to win because right is on our side. Because freedom, democracy have to win. And as our leader, Manfred Weber, Weber said today, in this fight we have to protect our people. We have to protect our businesses and our SMEs. And it, as it was repeated during first panel, we have to protect our labor market. Although, as Manfred said, we can only do 
this fight together from European through national to regional and local level. We need solidarity among countries and solidarity among citizens. In short term, to survive this winter, we need to reduce our energy consumption in public buildings and we want to be uh, leaders on that and in the private buildings creating good incentives for our citizens. We have to unlock all potential in our sources of clear energy production, especially this local one. And last of higher, highest importance, we have to protect our people, especially this most vulnerable, to mitigate influence of this war on them, restraining explosion of energy prices. And as we could hear today, our EPP leaders have a solution prepared and we have to help them to implement it as soon as possible. In the longer term, we need to rebuild completely our energy policy in an innovative manner. We need to speed up implementation of, of innovations in the energy sector, more green and independent energy, more storages, more connections and more local resources of green energy. Moreover, as it was said during second panel, we need more innovation not only in the energy sector, we need, innova uh, we, we need invigorate our global competitiveness to develop our economy, providing welfare for our citizens. Finally, I have to come back to moving speech of Mayor Boyshenko, a mayor of Mariupol, symbolic city completely devastated by barbarian Russian terror. We have to keep up our comprehensive support for Ukraine from military to humanitarian. And it is our duty to bring European hope that after this, their victory, they will be supported in the process of reconstruction of their cities. All this idea were raised today during this extremely important meeting and all of them are included in our very, very important the Brno Declaration, which is a clear manifest of our determination and our position regarding to the current crisis. I hope that everybody have it printed. So right now, I propose to adopt it by acclamation. Thank you very much, friends. As an EPP family, we have always been brave and protective. Brave people fight for victory and protect their beloved. As an EPP family, we protect our people and we fight, fight for them. And finally, we will win. Thank you very much for participation in today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I think lunch is waiting for you all. Um, thank you so much for your attention and your participation in today's event. And um, have a wonderful day. Thank you all.